Good evening. Welcome to the Select Board meeting Monday, January 27th, 2020. Um, my name is Diana Mahan. To my right, your left. John Hurd. Joe Curo. Dan Dunn. Steve DeCourcy. Adam Chaplin, Town Manager. Doug Heim, Town Council. Ashley Marr, Admin Assistant. Thank you. Um, and we have our Board Administrator, uh, Mrs. Kropelka, watching us from home, so we'll be on our best behavior. Um, and if I'm, I'm speaking a little funny tonight because I'm in the middle of some tooth surgery that started last Tuesday, so I don't want you to think it's not going to come out. It's in there good. Um, okay, first we'll do the consent agenda, minutes of meetings, January 6, 2020, reappointments, Commission on Disabilities, all terms to uh, expire 131-23, Karen Mathiason, LGBT, LGBTQIA plus Rainbow C Commission, Helene Newberg, Open Space Committee, Elizabeth Carr-Jones, Park and Recreation Commission, Shirley Kniff, Redevelopment Board, Eugene Benson, and Andrew Bennell for approval, contractor drain layer license, uh, McDougall Brothers out of Marshfield, Mass, a request special one-day all-alcohol license, 2120 at Arlington Catholic High School for quiz night, Elizabeth F Flynn, a request special <coughs> one-day beer and wine license, 2120 Robbins Memorial Town Hall for the Arlington Center for the Arts, Blue Jean Ball, Lisa Padula, request special one-day beer and wine license, 22220 at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event, Daniel Vagel, and for approval, Black History Month banners, Crystal Hines, Haynes, I'm sorry, Crystal Haynes, Arlington Human Rights Commission. First, is there a vote to? Madam Chair, I move approval sub to all conditions as set forth and with reference to uh, minutes of the meeting um, as, as revised and on our desks before us. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Hurd. Um, we all have been provided with a copy of the revised minutes, so that will be included with Mr. Kiro's motion. Is there anyone here to speak to, to any uh, agenda items under the consent agenda that I just read out? Certainly. Just name and... Crystal Haynes, uh, Arlington Human Rights Commission. Um, so uh, I had the idea of when I joined the Human Rights Commission is to make it more an inclusive community and to make that visible because we work super hard to make sure everyone feels welcome here. So um, I actually commissioned um, artwork for banners to go up in town and identified 16 poles. Uh, and so you guys may have gotten copies of them, but um, we had an artist uh, create um, banners that go up in town. You guys want to see them? And so they have... Um, figures uh, in African-American history connected to Massachusetts specifically, including the 54th Regiment and our own Prince Hall, who uh, is connected right here to Arlington. So uh, just I'm just requesting permission to put those banners up. And we have 16 polls, so maybe one year we'll have every poll in town will have a banner on it. But we'll start with these 16. Thank you so much Thank for you. doing Thank that. Thank you. Um, anyone else here to speak to items on the consent agenda? Any further questions or comments by my colleagues? If not, on a motion by Mr. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <coughs> Come on up. It's Karen Thiessen. What? She's one of the reappointees. A reappointee. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. certainly. Do you want, want the chair to come up with you, or? My husband is getting you. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm here because I was invited to come back and, I guess, try out for another term on the, um, the, the uh, Commission on Disabilities. Mm. And um, I'm delighted to be here. It's an exciting time, too, in the, um, in the Commission because we've just gotten our new um, Julian um, Harvey, who's our new um, Thank you, thank you. And um, we're really looking forward to working with her. And um, I hope to come back for another three, three terms, three, three years, whatever. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming thank out tonight. And um, the Disability Commission, um, every single member <coughs> who's on that um, board as a volunteer really brings 
years and years of expertise and uh, are very uh, knowledgeable and learned on the, su the subjects they deal with. And this board certainly um, does its best to endeavor to um, hear from them um, because they really do think of things and see things differently than um, the rest of us do. And it's really an invaluable resource. So I want to thank you and thank you to your husband for <laughs> bringing you out here tonight. And thank you for your willingness to continue to serve. Um, is there anyone else here for a consent agenda? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. We are at 722, <coughs> so we'll go to, right to the next public hearings. CDBG, uh, first a performance update for program year 1920. Ms. Wright. Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Jenny Wright, the Director of Planning and Community Development, and I'm going to be actually doing two items. Uh, if it would be okay, could I combine my remarks into one, Sorry. which is the first part is the mid-year report, and the second part is just a sort of overview of the CDBG applications for the next agenda item. And then I believe there are a number of subrecipients or applicants who are here who may wish to speak to both a mid-year update and also their application that they've submitted. Thank That's you. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. So uh, first and foremost, the Community Development Block Grant has been operating in Arlington for 45 years. We're very fortunate to be an entitlement community, which means that we receive funding directly from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and my department has been administering those funds for the town for all of those years for a whole range of activities, uh, mostly housing, economic development, infrastructure, sometimes funding public facilities, including improvements to public places and spaces that we all know about, um, and um, including ones on the civic block, um, and public services in the community. Um, these are funds that if we did not have otherwise, it would be very challenging for organizations to continue their operations, to be able to deliver really critical programs to primarily low and moderate income individuals in Arlington and serving low mod populations throughout the town. So we're very fortunate to be able to receive these funds. And historically, on average, over all of the years, we've actually received about $1.8 million annually on average. The last decade or so is when we started to sort of go downwards in terms of the amount that we've been receiving year over year, which includes this past year where we had actually about $11,000 less to appropriate um, through the CDBG subcommittee of yours. Um, but we have been able to actually achieve quite a bit, even though we have limited funds, in part because we serve so many organizations that do fantastic fundraising and resource development, have creative leadership. I'm sure that they might frame it differently. <coughs> the agony of fundraising is, I know, challenging, and asking for dollars for critical community needs is not always easy. But the community often rallies around these topics, and that helps to keep things afloat. But CDBG is really critical. And this past year, which was year 45, the town was awarded just over $1.1 million. We actually were able to leverage $260,000 just in this past grant program year through program income and some unappropriated funds. So that made for about a $1.3 million program. And of course, as you can see from this program year, we've got a lot of interest in the funding sources. So there's no problem spending $1.3 million. Um, and all of the CDBG subrecipients are making really great progress in achieving their anticipated goals and outcomes. Those are the things that they <coughs> state in their application that they desire to achieve, which might include a certain number of people or individuals served, um, a certain number of buildings built or preserved. Um, there are a number of different metrics, as you know, for goal achievement. Um, and all of the subrecipients have made that progress. I'm going to talk about things by category now. So in the affordable housing initiatives this past year, the Housing Corporation of Arlington remains our primary subrecipient of funding. They continue to make capital improvements to their portfolio of affordable housing. They actually had only three units allocated for this year to uh, make those capital improvements. They've made improvements to two of those properties and have one more to complete. So they're nearly at their goal. The second project that we funded with HCA was to install solar panel panels at their Capitol Square apartments on Mass Ave. Uh, the project is currently out to bid, and we're expecting that installations will be happening later this year. I am not certain if anybody from HCA is able to provide any update on that or any of the other items that I might speak to, but um, 
my understanding is that that's the progress. They had some challenges in finding, uh, in, I believe, installers for solar panels and may have wanted to get <coughs> a little bit more input in terms of uh, getting the best bid in order to make the best uh, investment in those panels for the long term. For public service programs, as you know, this is uh, limited to 20% of the overall grant, but we often have a lot of demand for this particular area. Over 1,200 people have been served since July 1st of 2019. Just over half of the fiscal year is over, but the Arlington Boys and Girls Club, Operation Success through the Arlington Housing Authority, Fidelity House also, they've already met or exceeded their anticipated outcome goals of serving 278 low mod income individuals. The Council on Aging also exceeded their goals for the transportation and volunteer coordinator programs, both of them serving a total of 900 people and have also nearly reached their annual goal of 20 people for service through their adult day health program. Two additional subrecipients are more than halfway to their goal, and one more is ha just under halfway to their goal of serving the number of people they anticipated. For public facilities and improvements, uh, as you know, the ADA uh, curb cuts have been the primary area where we funded year over year. This year we installed, or the DPW installed rather, 45 ADA compliant curb cuts in the Sunnyside area, which is just off of Broadway in East Arlington. The Wellington Park project, um, which is the park on Grove Street, that actually the uh, trail access project was one of our projects funded in the current grant program year. We issued an RFP for project design for an extension of that trail and are anticipating that we'll be able to begin work soon by uh, June. The Luciano Park Reconstruction Project, which is headed up by the Recreation Department, that had a couple of public hearings as part of input on the design process. My understanding is that they also will be um, continuing to seek input from residents <coughs> on that project and aiming to have a final design in place by June. Foodlink uh, completed their acquisition of their new headquarters on Sum Summer Street, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about that. Envision Arlington their annual survey, as you know, we fund that every year, also using uh, some CDBG funds as well as town funds. All of the survey is now digital and online this year, as opposed to prior years where we were sort of easing into the digital, I think last year, it is now completely digital. And as of mid-January, we had 2,400 surveys. So if you're listening to me talk again about surveys, I hope everybody is taking it or has taken it. So that's the, the overview of what we've done in this past year. We um, also did a number of planning projects, which included funding the ADA self-evaluation and transition plan. A portion of that plan was funded by the Mass Office on Disability. The other portion <coughs> was funded by the CDBG funds. And then also we've appropriated some funding through CDBG this year towards the Fair Housing Action Plan, which will be something that we'll come back to you at a future meeting to talk with you more about. Um, and that sort of relates as a segue into the next program year. So for CDBG applications for year 46, or do you want me to pause? Um, does anyone have any questions on any of that? No. no. Okay. So we anticipate receiving approximately the same amount of funding for this next coming year. You know, we don't know. We, we, we project how much we <coughs> might receive based on past years. I mentioned the average. It's been in a decline state we did happen to have 1.3 million this past year. My guess is that we'll receive 1.1 million for the next, uh, for year 46. We received 20 applications. Um, one of those applications, of course, is from my department, which includes four different or five different activities, planning and admin. Um, the new applications include a number of new items. Often, year over year, you'll see a lot of familiar applications and familiar funding amounts even. Um, this year, I just wanted to give you kind of a spotlight of some of the new things. One of those new things is the phase two of the Whittemore Park project. When we did the planning for the revitalization of Whittemore Park, which was funded by CPA, we went back to CPA for the first phase of that project, which funded the first portion in front of the Jefferson Cutter House in the park itself. The second phase is to fund the portion around the Jefferson Cutter House, in order to make it ADA compliant. And then the third phase is actually into the capital plan, which is for improvements to the rear of the, of the building. So phase two of Whittemore Park is on the um, 
potential for applications for next year. Town Hall Plaza improvements, which is the area at the Mass Ave entryway, where there are a number <coughs> of improvements proposed in order to make it an easier, much more accessible space. There are a number of uh, components to that walkway that are lifting or um, in need of repair, and so the town hall improvements are also uh, being proposed. Arlington Eats is proposing two different applications. One is for capital improvements to the fit out of space at 117 Broadway, and the other one is for operational support so that they may carry out their programs while they're going through a challenging transition process in order to fit out their new space as a market. Um, an energy efficiency program, which is being proposed by my department. That uh, program would mean we would be able to leverage weatherization funds, which we currently receive from the state uh, as the Department of Housing and Community Development, as well as from utility companies. And leveraging all of those funds combined would mean for a much more, uh, much more improved program overall, and also being able to help lower income households, which is something that we can't always do using just weatherization funds. We've also proposed a workforce development grant program. This would enable us to expand upon our existing economic development programs that we currently offer. And for this one, it would be potentially serving five businesses annually and starting it as a pilot program to determine if we'd be able to fund and finance workforce development for low mod income individuals to get into the workforce, sort of a job training program, as well as providing uh, subsidies for businesses who are willing to employ others to join the workforce. And then the new plans that we've proposed in the document around the planning and administrative um, components to the CDBG program include a housing production plan update. We will be, our existing housing production plan will expire in 2021. And so, uh, we are in the midst of doing this Fair Housing Action Plan. We are hoping to utilize that plan as a segue into a, housing, a new housing production plan and also include community engagement process that we included the last time that we created the plan, which includes new data, new understanding of needs and demands in the community, as well as the whole process to create new strategies for a new five-year plan. And then also we are proposing, I guess lastly, a neighborhood revitalization strategy area planning process for Arlington Center. This is a very specific phrase. I, it's HUD terminology, so it's not, it wouldn't be my, necessarily my phrasing of it, but it is if we are able to create a neighborhood revitalization strategy area for the center, we would then be able to leverage additional CDBG funds in the future to help with improvements in a much greater way than we can right now. And without that plan, we're not able to do that. So we would like to be able to enter into that phase of helping Arlington Center. So just to tell you a little bit about the next steps before I pause, the application review, the next steps in that, as you know, every year we do a CDBG subcommittee. They'll usually meet twice to review the applications. The subcommittee that you created last year includes two of your members as well as three residents who participated last year and also desire to continue that attendance and participation. Um, that propo we're proposing that we have these meetings to review the applications in early February um, and then to be able to come back to the board with recommendations by late February, early March. We're on a somewhat tighter tight frame for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that we did the citizen participation plan that we adopted, I think, a couple months ago. That plan has much tighter time frames for input, um, and particularly in a year where we have the annual, the uh, consolidated plan, which is a five-year required plan by HUD that we are in the process of doing. We need to do that at the same time as our annual action plan. Usually we do the annual action plan much farther down, even past town meeting, because that's typically the process that Arlington uses. We do our recommendations, they go to town meeting for endorsement. We need to move that up in the process this year due to the fact that it's the five-year consolidated plan year. We've done that in past years when you're in the midst of the five-year plan update. So that's that need to do things simultaneously is pushing up the timeline. The rest of our process, of course, will remain the same. <coughs> so with that, I thank you for your time and I'm open to any questions you have um, of me on either one of these. On the, um, first I want to thank you for the mid-year report. That's something that the board um, asked for a couple of years ago, basically to keep track of um, what everybody's doing and get the word out, but also on the, 
off chance that there's a year that a program says we've already accomplished this, we won't be using some remaining funds, and we can give it to something else that we wanted to say yes to. Um, so that I do thank you for that. Could you remind me on the, um, when we had the CDBG subcommittee meetings last year, I want to do it so it's, it's to the, everybody's uh, schedules, especially the three citizens. Did we do that on a Saturday or, do you remember when we had the meetings? We did it on, I think, Tuesday mornings. Tuesday mornings, um, okay. So we were looking for times, we have a couple that we floated out yeah, there. I think we'll sure. solidify that. Right. So that, that seemed to work. I mean, the earlier the better for me. But you see, will you, you Mom, Ms. Ray, through the planning department, yes. reach out and coordinate that meeting so I don't have to worry? Okay. We will be coordinating the meeting. Mr. Absolutely. Dunn and I will um, okay. continue to serve on that. Um, any questions from my colleagues? Um, if not, um, I'd open it up to the uh, CDBG request for 2020-2021 funding. If you just want to come up to the microphone, name and program for the record. Hi, Ooh, my name is Janet McGuire. <clears throat> Excuse me. Peggy Regan. Peggy Regan, yes, this is the team for Operation Success. Um, we are in our new building um, down at Monotomy Manor. Um, this year we have 30 students, um, residents that live down there between sixth grade and high school. Um, we're open from Monday through Thursday evenings, 6.30, uh, well, 7 o'clock till 8.30. And um, we are... Pull the microphone oh, up. I'm sorry, talk right into it. Thank oh, thank you. you. Is that better? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Um, this year we have 30 kids that are participating. Um, it fluctuates nightly on their participation. Um, also that the money that we are requesting goes to supplies for the center for each of the students. And at the end of the year, we get them backpacks and school supplies that they cannot afford for the following year. We are going into our 21st year of running this. Um, and I still feel, and I think Peggy and everyone else still feels that it's been very successful. And again, thank you for considering us for the grant. <clears throat> and um, we've been open for 21 years. We're open four nights a week, um, all strictly volunteers. And that's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. um, Janet is the one that got started this whole thing. She dragged me into it, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> but here I am. And I understand why we go, because we started it. But I think about the teachers from Audison, the teachers from Kibbs that work all day, come down there at night, and they're all not local. They all don't live in Arlington. They come from other towns. And also some of the um, other people that aren't teachers that come and volunteer, they've been doing it. That's what's keeping us going. So I just wanted to give a little shout out to them. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm glad you did, because I was going to say, can you remind us who these volunteers <laughs> are, who work all day and are underpaid, in my opinion? <laughs> Once in a while, we do a little article in the paper. We mention all the names, and they're amazing to me. Yeah. They're just amazing. So. Anyway, the Arlington residents also volunteer down there. Yeah. This year, I just want to say that we had a nice um, addition to it. We had Tufts doctoral students um, that participated in it, and they were doing groups with the kids um, for the fall semester of their doctorate degree. So we're hoping that we can continue some partnership mm -hmm. with some of the local universities as well. That's amazing. I wish you all were there when I lived down there. <laughs> you couldn't even get a free hot dog, let alone a free teacher or, or Tufts doctor. So thank you um, so We much. also want to say thank you um, to everyone. We really appreciate it. And hello to Marie Karpelka. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deanne DuPont with Food Link. First, I want to thank the town and uh, the <coughs> CDV G grant that we received in prior years, and for the town uh, making space available that we could rent for several months because we're in a year of transition. We'll have one to two more moves before we're in our space. Um, a little bit of background of our status with our space is that we've applied for our building permit. Uh, we're waiting for one more form from the MAAB uh, that needs to go to the building department, and we hope to start construction in March, but you'll start seeing activity in February. 
So it's a little bit of background where we are. Uh, what we're looking for this coming year is we've applied for uh, 175,000 under the public facilities, and that is to help fund the lift to make our space even more accessible. We'd have a lift plus a ramp. Also a generator, we're hoping to be able to uh, hopefully get incorporated into the town of Arlington's emergency preparedness plan so that we'll be able to keep our cold storage operating during emergencies. <coughs> then also we've requested uh, assistance with solar uh, panels as well as the exterior, some of the painting and repairs that need to be done to the exterior so that we can make part of Summer Street look even nicer and more inviting. Uh, a little bit about the a little bit of numbers. So we provide about 325,000 pounds of food to Arlington, but we only source 250,000 pounds from Arlington. So we get another 75,000 pounds from mainly from Lexington and Medford, and we bring that into Arlington to help service Arlington. We service about 3,300 individuals here in Arlington that are mostly low, low, moderate, uh, older adults and those with disabilities. So the ROI on the investment, if we were fully funded, is about $54 a person, which uh, provides them about, <coughs> each one, about 100 pounds of food, which equates to about 80 nutritious meals a year for $54. And of course, what we're asking for are improvements that will last much longer than one year. So if you look at it over five years, I'm, I'm an accountant, so sorry. <laughs> if you look at it over five years, it's a $10 investment for each person for over the five-year period. Um, and just to let you know, you know, we don't always just get our money from CDBG. We have many other funders that are out there. The Greater Boston Food Bank has been very generous. They see the benefit that we're creating. Uh, we've also gotten funding from Eastern Bank, from the Ludkey Foundation, from organizations in Lexington and Cambridge, st strictly for capital. We're also fortunate to receive $85,000 in grant money to, uh, for our operations in Arlington, Lexington, Bill Ricker, Burlington, and Woburn. So not only does the town see the value in what we're providing, but also the state is, finding, is seeing the value in what we provide, as well as many uh, individuals from all over eastern Massachusetts help to support what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Andy Doan, and the executive director of Arlington Eats, and this is Lauren Ledger, uh, the, one of the co-founders of the original Arlington Eats, as well as a board member. Um, so we're here tonight to represent Arlington Eats, which grew out of the merger of two nonprofit organizations, um, the Arlington Food Pantry, which was started in 1991, and the original Arlington Eats, which really was about um, serving lunches and um, snacks to Arlington's most vulnerable and at-risk children and their families. Since our merger, we've become one of the largest social service providers here in Arlington. Uh, we serve as about 1,800 in unique individuals um, that are low to moderate income residents of Arlington. So currently, each week at our market, which is the new name for the food pantry, uh, we serve an average of 165 families, and we serve over 3,000 meals through our summer and vacation lunch program. Um, this past summer, we commissioned two Tufts University graduate students um, to interview our market shoppers. And so some of the things we learned was, one, 31% um, of those that come to the market receive all or most of their food from Arlington Eats. That's a lot. Mm. We also learned that 60% of those who use the market do not use any other community resource, community food resource, rather. So Arlington Eats is definitely a vital resource for those who are low and moderate income residents in Arlington. However, we do know that there's 3,500 food insecure residents in Arlington. And so we're looking at how we can connect to even more of these residents um, because we know that when people have access to food, they have access to learning, they have, they have access to s employment. Um, so it's just a an opportunity for us to be able to not only provide people's nutritious needs, but their long-term needs as well. So in our 30-year history of being <coughs> here in Arlington, we have now the opportunity to have our own space at 117 Broadway. So when Housing Corporation of Arlington purchased this property back in 2014, it was Housing Corporation, a group of churches, as well as the town's Health and Human Services Department that kind of came up with a plan where if HCA um, purchased the property, then the food pantry at the time could then have space on the first floor. So we are asking for $400,000 for a fit out of our space. 
Um, this space, we believe, will offer um, a really dignified way for people to access food. Um, and most importantly, we'll be able to accommodate a lot more folks. So we currently serve 1,800 people, but we know there's 3,500. So how can we move that? So one of the things is we need to be open more often, which has not been an opportunity for us in any of the other spaces because we've always shared spaces um, with other people. We are also looking at ways that we can partner with other agencies here in Arlington. So having a meeting space that's available, as well as a private conference room where individuals and resources can get connected together. Um, so this will also be our headquarters. So this will be the first time we can have all of our operations under one um, roof, except for our summer lunch program, which we will, of course, keep at the schools. So needless to say, we are very excited and eager for this opportunity to move forward. As you will notice from our applications, we submitted two of them this year. Our main application, our hopeful application, our big application um, is associated with the um, property that Andy was just describing. As some of you may or may not know, there has been some confusion with HUD, and it is unclear whether we can move forward with this application. So I am just here to say that we have appealed to all of our elected officials. Um, Congresswoman Catherine Clark's office is helping us right now, and I hope um, that we are able to move forward with this really vital resource for our community. I also want to thank each and every one of you on the board because you guys have been there serving lunches with us and helping out at the market. Um, you have all been great supporters of our organization, and we are really hopeful that we are able to uh, work together in the coming months. Thanks. So the two applications are sort of the main <coughs> application at 117 Broadway, but sort of, I don't want to say a backup plan, but um, lack of a better word. Well, it, um, it's a supplemental plan. So okay. as Andy mentioned, that our main application is uh, $400,000. And our supplemental application is $10,000 to help um, with some food resources. So um, certainly not apples to apples, okay. um, but uh, mm -hmm. we have submitted both of them. Looking forward to delving into the app two applications. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lisa Urban from Fidelity House. I do have a cold. I apologize. Um, just want to thank you. We run a program. We've been doing it um, probably since the 70s. We had started kind of down running a program, but it's really emerged. And um, once Charlie Lyons was able to really help the town get um, community development block grant, you guys have really helped us out. And it's an awesome program. The kids... Um, we do three things. We found really that um, transportation um, was a key to getting kids to participate. So we do a, a summer camp where the kids come to, we bring the kids to Fidelity House and then we go off site. And this year we went to Regis because uh, Minuteman dropped their pool um, when they built the new building. And the place obviously was awesome and a little more expensive for us, but it turned out it was a perfect experience for the kids, the swimming abilities with the use of that pool and the more um, shallow end, they became awesome swimmers. So they, we offered two weeks of camp at least, if not more, um, for kids to come to Fidelity House camp. We pick them up, we bring them to camp, and then we bring them back home. And then during the school year, we pick them up once a week. Um, they come to Fidelity House and participate in all our programs if not more on Saturday mornings. We'll pick up also for our basketball programs. And then, um, then we also do an on-site program once a week. So we really do try to make sure that we get all different ages and kids involved, and we really can't do it without the CDBG, and it's been awesome. Um, I know I asked a little bit more last year, and it worked out great. In fact, the kids that really came during the summer have really been showing up during the school year, which is why we had a little bit more jump in our numbers too. We were worried when we switched day camps, um, but it's been really nice and I thank you. Uh, and then we also have the, the high school staff that work for us during the summer. We call it the Jobs, 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 and I know the Arlington Boys and Girls Club turns in theirs also, but it's, you know, we're both looking to 
um, have kids working and then they learn a skill and working with kids and it's a lifelong, they're gonna be parents themselves um, and they've been great staff and then most of the time they work for us year round. Um, it's been a great relationship and hope it continues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Thanks for having me. I'm Christine Shaw, the interim director for the Council on Aging. Um, and we have three um, grant applications in the CDBG applications this year again. Um, one is for our Adult Day Health Program, which is every year has been very successful in getting Arlington residents access to Adult Day Health Programs that are very pricey, expensive, um, and people might otherwise not be exposed to it. So that's one of them. And then the other two really focus on um, our volunteers and transportation. So I'll speak to them kind of as a whole is what a big part of the Council on Aging those initiatives are. Um, the, the select board has been very supportive in the past of our transportation programs and department, um, but we have really expanded a lot of our transportation over the past year. Um, our COA vans that are around town have almost doubled in how frequently they're running. Um, we have a, a, an extra van basically on the road four days a week, which has been very helpful. Um, the five um, housing authority buildings have been able to receive um, free van rides since the beginning of September, just so that they could, we had a big campaign for them to be more aware of the service that we can offer them to get them around town, to get them out of their homes, to bring them to the senior center, soon to be community center, um, and to get them meeting with their social workers, visiting their friends, going grocery shopping, getting to Arlington Eats, um, really making sure we're getting them around town. So. The um, volunteer medical escort program is still a huge part of transportation for us. We're pairing um, residents with volunteers probably on average 12 to 15 rides a week, um, getting them to ride to their doctor's appointments all over greater Boston, so not just Lee and Mount Auburn. But, um, you know, we have volunteers driving people to Brigham and Women's to Mass General at rush hour. It's, an, it's a pretty unbelievable um, group of people that is supported by the volunteer coordinator position, but also as a part of the transportation program. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to say, too, for this past year, we've reached out to a lot of the different um, partnering organizations like Arlington Eats to see what we can offer that our transportation can help supplement to get their um, people there. And we've been able to offer um, free rides to the food pantry for anybody that's going there. And our office has been handling the scheduling for that and making sure that happens. So just wanted to highlight a couple of the things because those are our two primary ass aside from the health day, uh, adult day health applications that we have in there. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you for everyone and continue to um, provide explanations <coughs> because a lot of us in this room, we're aware of um, these different programs and resources, but just on the off chance someone else watching this at home might say, oh, I didn't know I could get help with that. So um, Mr. Leonard. Good evening. Uh, John Leonard, uh, town meeting member, precinct 17. Earlier, the director mentioned uh, a location called Town Hall Plaza. Where was actually Town Hall Plaza located? Jenny Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, the Town Hall, literally right outside of Town Hall at 730 Mass Ave, the, the area that is right in front of the main three doorways that come into Town Hall. There's a, I'm sorry, the material might be concrete, it might be granite. 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 Um, all of that granite, and then some of it is brick. There's sort of a ramp um, that goes around, and then there's obviously the steps. All of that, I believe, is subject to the, the entire reconstruction project in order to uh, reset bricks and granite. And I think install, install something below it, maybe? Heating? <coughs> that, that's been discussed. Yeah. That's been discussed, okay. So we're still working on the details of the project, but that is where that is the location. Thank you, because basically you just took the wind right out of my sails. But that was what I was going to speak on, because between the years 2003 and 2007, I was lucky enough to be a member of the Town Day Committee, 
And it was one of those years that probably two, three o'clock in the afternoon on town day, I witnessed along with others, our town administrator, Marie Kapelka, fall and hurt herself right in front of the front door. Uh, my question is, if you round it off and say, hypothetically, it might have been my last year, 2007, 13 years have gone by and nothing's been done in regards to the town hall steps. Uh, I don't understand why. Maybe a couple of pennies couldn't have been set aside in 13 years to maybe make either studies or appropriations or a little bit of work they have done on it. And uh, I just, I, I really don't understand. Luckily, she wasn't injured that badly. But uh, Marie, I know you're out there. Uh, I still remember it and how we all rushed to your aid. And frankly, I'll close by saying, according to the definition of the CBG funds, one of the comments made in the newspaper about what it is, the money is to meet the needs that pose a threat to the health and the welfare of the community. I can think of no better cause than the front steps out in front of town hall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Okay, <clears throat> I think that brings a close. Um, if it's appropriate um, with town council, could we take a joint uh, motion to uh, move receipt of the performance update for program year 2019-2020, as well as move receipt of um, the CDBG request for 2020-2021? Yes. Can we do it all together? Okay, move receipt by Mr. Sorry, Ms. Madam Chair. Okay. Um, does the town manager get a vote in this or only in the allocation? I believe the town manager. Just in the allocation. Okay. okay, thank you. I would, would not have remembered that. Okay, uh, so was that a motion by Mr. Dunn? So moved. Seconded by Second. Mr. Kiro. Any further questions or comments? Um, I just want to say on the workforce development component, I'm really excited about that. I have a direct link. Um, into workforce development out of um, Staniford Street. So as that moves along, I'll, if appropriate, plug myself in. On a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Caro to move receipt on items eight and nine. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you so much. We now have a Zoning Board of Appeals alternate <coughs> member to voting member, Kevin Mills. I'm going to wait just one minute. Let everyone. Oh, they're leaving quietly, I guess. Okay, sorry. Good evening. Good evening. Um, just say your name and any, any brief thing. Uh, we're all aware of what. Um, Kevin Mills, longtime resident, town meeting member for about 20 years, precinct one. You're now willing to go from an alternate to a voting member on yes. the <laughs> our Zoning Board of Appeals, which looks like it's going to have a really uh, sort of heavy calendar coming up. And yes. appreciate that there's no learning curve for you coming into this position because mm -hmm. you've already been totally immersed in this um, for quite some time. And that's something that's very valuable. And I want to thank you for um, taking pleasure. one less headache off my head. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Dunn? Yeah. Um, my colleagues are bored with this speech, but nonetheless, you'll get it, <laughs> which is uh, the, this Mugar decision is so important, and it's so important that uh, it, like, it is going to end up in court. We know it's going to end up in court, and the quality of the decision that the, the ZBA renders is going to make all the difference in terms of uh, how that court case goes, and uh, it's, it's vital that you get all the support that you need to get a, to a good decision, so if you need something, call the town manager. <coughs> if you need something, call one of us. And uh, we really want to make sure that you're equipped with everything you need to get to a good place. Understood and thank you. Thank you. We've already received substantial support from uh, Mr. Helms' office. Thank you. Uh, move approval. Moved by Mr. Dunn. Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. Um, any further questions or, co or comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, unanimous vote. Good to see you again. We'll be seeing you Thank soon, you. I'm sure. Um, did, uh, citizens open forum, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall not be acted upon, nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three-minute time limit to present a concern or request, and we have Deanne DuPont. She was CBG. 
Oh, she are, Deanne already spoke, so okay. Um, John Leonard, did you want to speak? Thank you again, just very quickly, John Leonard, town meeting member, Precinct 17. For anybody who's watched the uh, Democratic debates, they've noticed that all the candidates, for the most part, have like a little rostrum in front of them in which to present their paperwork, look at their information, et cetera, et cetera. It causes somebody to wonder why, if you have that particular situation for presidential candidates, if even in town hall here in Arlington, when the Arlington High School project people get up and have their meetings, they are provided with one of the rostrums from town hall, uh, even just recently in honor of the, the late Martin Luther King when they had the ceremony downstairs, a rostrum was provided for speakers up on top of the stage. So it made me wonder and do a little bit of investigating as to why there is not any kind of a little rostrum such as we have three of them downstairs behind the curtain doing absolutely nothing. Why couldn't a rostrum be put up here for people who come up and discuss issues in front of the board? To answer some of the obvious questions, how would we get it up here? There is an elevator that would bring up one of the rostrums. Uh, the rostrums, to the best of my knowledge, weigh only about 58 pounds. They are on wheels. Uh, wouldn't that interfere with town meeting? Well, not really, because I've been a town meeting member now for over 20 years. Very seldom do I remember all three rostrums going at the same time. And lastly, going over some past years, all the way back to 2014, the most we've ever had for town meetings is six occasions for town meetings, so that would be three Mondays. So there would only be three Mondays inconvenience if at that particular time those three Mondays coincided with a selectmen's meeting. So I would like to hear from the board as to why one of those rostrums, which again are collecting dust, added to the fact too that if, this board, if the select board meets twice a month, that's 24 meetings a year. If you turn <coughs> around and deduct town meeting, let's say nine, then they get something like 15 times that a person could actually stand up here with paperwork and present their case without having to fumble, hold their coats, whatever. So again, it's just something for the board to consider. Why couldn't one of those rostrums, again, collecting dust downstairs, be wheeled it up here and make it a little bit easier for people to discuss their case in front of you? Okay. I'll That's definitely look point. into that. We'll Thank get you. back to you. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Um, Patricia B. Warden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, since my remarks are only concerning the hazard mitigation report, I would like to ask your permission to make my remarks after the presentation of that report. Do I have your permission to do that? Um, no, we don't. Um, uh, it's only warrant article hearings that we allow people to come up and speak on it, so if you want to speak on it now. Yes, although it did say in the newspaper that it would be allowed, that these comments would be allowed after. Okay, I will make them now. If well, that's your how long are they about? Do you want to? Um, they're somewhat over three minutes, about four minutes. Should we do that? See, I think let the presentation go and uh, give her an opportunity. Okay, you, you can do it after the presentation. Okay, Sounds thank you. Okay. okay, sorry. Um, so that's agenda item, so I don't forget. 11. <coughs> Andy Doan? She was, was CG here. as well. Um, Beth Malofchik. Hi, Beth Malofchik, town meeting member, um, Russell Street. Um, I would like to express a little um, perplexity at the fact that I see single-use plastic water bottles in front of me. This is the third time in town hall. I saw them in August at the select board goal-setting meeting in the town manager's um, conference room. I saw them last week at an event here in town hall, and I see them now before me. I hope we're a forward-thinking town, and I hope we're going to disallow single-use water bottles in town. We've got water fountains. Maybe they need to be updated with that spigot for uh, personal water vessels, but 
that's not setting a very good example. Everything the town does should have at its core climate resiliency, tree canopy fortification, and we should be asking, does a particular project enhance our commercial tax base? We all want safe sidewalks and mature, healthy trees in the ground, not in pots. Placing the onus of tree removal on the need for ADA sidewalks, which we all agree we want, is both disingenuous and, frankly, offensive. That's what I understand the Department of Planning has done with the uh, request to remove trees from both Whittemore Park and Broadway Plaza. <coughs> also at Broadway Plaza, I'd like to question the use of public funds to renovate a public space for the exclusive private use of cafes. I'm curious as to whether or not you're increasing cafe space there. I would like to know how much Cafe Nero pays for the use of that exclusive public space that they have even now when they're not using it, they have it fenced off. So that seems to be public space that's, that's whose use is excluded. Um, uh, Cook's Hollow. We have a potential nor'easter coming, uh, Groundhog Day, and our one bio uh, research biotech uh, business in town is right there on Mystic Street at the bridge, and the bridge for several weeks now has had several large trees, branches, refuse, collecting there underneath in the culvert, preventing water from getting through. So I hope that's taken care of. I already put it in the town, you know, this needs to be done page, I forget what it's called, request thing. Um, but I think that's a hazard that needs to be mitigated. Thank you. Um, uh, so you know, I want Arlington to have a holistic town-wide plan to fortify the tree canopy to, the, to unite our emerald necklace, our pox, parks, pocket parks, and green spaces, planting, not removing trees. Um, uh, and I think the loss of 200 geothermal wells at the high school would turn what should be a bright and shining beacon in Arlington, the new high school, into Chapter Lane's big dig. So I hope that doesn't happen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think I will take exception to your comment because I really think that um, you can come in here and you can render opinion and you can suggest ways that we can improve them and you can do it with a tone of charity and friendliness and it would be greatly appreciated as opposed to personal attacks. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Um, next we have Ann Wright. Thank you, Mr. Good Dunn. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Wright. I live in East Arlington. I know some of you. Um, I'm a member of the local Mothers Out Front chapter. I also founded the town gas leaks task force with our town manager, which has been meeting for about two years. I'm here tonight with Amos Meeks um, of Sustainable Arlington to strongly encourage the select board to support a warrant article that would ban fossil fuel infrastructure hookups in new construction and major renovations. This move would be a logical follow-up to our heat smart contract, which allowed many residents, including myself, to replace their oil or gas burners um, fairly affordably with air source heat pumps. The global science community agrees that we need to reduce our carbon emissions by at least 50% in the next 10 years to avoid the most catastrophic offense, uh, um, effects of climate change, and we can all see that coming daily now. We can't do this, the scientists say, without significantly reducing our use of methane gas for household use, including heat, hot water, and cooking, although that's a minor, a minor portion of, of uh, fossil fuel use. If we did this, if we passed such a warrant article, we'd be following in the footsteps of Brookline's town meeting that passed such uh, an article in November. We'd also be joining with a growing handful of other towns and cities in the area that are proposing similar things. What we'd love is that each of you on the Board of Selectmen would agree to meet one-on-one -on -one with myself or Sustainable Arlington members, and um, over the coming weeks or month or so and, and discuss this. This is not an easy um, concept um, to understand. I know I've been on a huge learning curve trying to grasp what it would really mean. Um, but uh, let's, I, I propose that we educate ourselves as a town about it. 
we use all the smart and energetic people in town and um, get public input and hopefully um, take another bold move into um, a clean energy future for our town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Amos Meeks. Hello, um, I'm Amos Meeks. Thanks for uh, letting me speak. Um, I just wanted to, so I'm the co-chair of Sustainable Arlington. I live in, I live in East Arlington. Um, I'm here with Ann Wright. Um, I just wanted to sort of reiterate um, my support for this uh, potential bylaw amendment. Um, Anne, I think, had um, gave a lot of great justification and we'll ta be talking about more of that between now and town meeting. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of make sure and advocate for making sure that the warrant article language is broad enough to let us <coughs> sort of consider various um, deviations or changes from the sort of example that Brookline has laid out. Um, there are a lot of things we might want to change, some of the exemptions, we maybe would want to do a fine instead of going through the permit process, things like that. Um, so I just want to make sure as we're considering the language now um, that it's broad enough for us, for us to figure that out through public input um, over the next couple of months. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I would just um, ask Ms. Wright and Mr. Meeks, um, I'm assuming um, we have the contact information at the select board's office. If there's an email or a cell phone or other contact number that um, we may not have, if you could just call the office tomorrow and to make sure we follow up on those requests. And that is the last person I have for Citizens Open Forum. See no one else. We will now go to traffic <coughs> rules and orders, other business. Agenda item 11, discussion and approval, hazard mitigation plan. Um, is this Mr. Chaplain? We pay you all that? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, who's, is it Ms. Rate, our planning director? Okay. quickly. Jenny Rate again, director of planning and community development. I am here with Martin Pillsbury, who is the environmental director, uh, director of environmental planning for the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and also Emily Sullivan, who is our environmental planner and conservation agent from the Department of Planning and Community Development. So tonight, you're actually, I'm going to hand this over very quickly to Martin, who is going to make a presentation to you to explain to you what the, what the purpose is of the hazard mitigation plan, what it constitutes, how it intersects with other plans that we have created or will be creating or might be updating, um, and I think just a little bit more about the process between now and when we need this to be adopted and what happens next. So I'm going to hand it over to Martin. <coughs> thank you very much, and, and thank you for making the time uh, to uh, discuss this important plan. Uh, once again, I'm Martin Pillsbury. The microphone up. Sorry. I'm Martin Pillsbury, the Director of Environmental Planning at MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which is the regional planning uh, council for which Arlington and 100 other cities and towns in the area belong to. Uh, tonight I'm going to give you an overview of the FEMA hazard mitigation plan that the town is in the midst of, uh, of preparing. In fact, the, the draft plan is, is before you. Uh, and this is a plan that if you're used to looking at comprehensive plans, master plans, open space plans, this may be a plan that has been under your radar compared to some of those other plans. Uh, why is the town doing this plan? It's part of a federal program across the whole country established by FEMA in the wake of the Disaster Mitigation Act back in the year 2000 to establish a process to develop local hazard mitigation plans, the goal that FEMA has in every city and town in the country. Uh, and then MEMA, the Mass Emergency Management Agency, takes over managing this program within our Commonwealth uh, and um, helps uh, communities to do this through a grant program. Uh, and MAPC uh, has been uh, brought into this, help, helping the town put together this plan under that grant program. Um, now, the, the town already has one of these plans. The first one was put together and approved by FEMA in 2012. So the, the, to the goal before us uh, this year has been to update these plans because uh, FEMA requires them to be periodically updated both to keep the plan current, you know, the kind of information that's in there you know, can, uh, can get old and needs to be kept current, but also administratively uh, having a plan in place that's current and approved by FEMA will make the town eligible for a number of FEMA grants. 
So the first thing to distinguish between, the, there's a, a big FEMA landscape out there. I think earlier, uh, Jenny Ray mentioned some HUD language. Uh, we use FEMA language. I think we found out that every federal agency has its own distinct dialect. If I use some terminology that's not familiar, please let me know. I'm trying to put it into English. Uh, the idea here is that there are a wide range of different kinds of plans that FEMA and MEMA have put together or, or, and communities participate in. This is a particular slice of, 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 of planning that only really deals with natural hazard mitigation. So that's to distinguish it from hazards that might be human caused, like hazardous chemical leaks, infrastructure breakdowns, et cetera. Uh, we're looking at all categories of natural hazards, however, flooding, high winds and hurricanes, winter storms, snow and ice, brush fires, uh, even things that are less common but possible, earthquakes, landslides, extreme temperatures, and droughts. Uh, the other thing to note is that this, the very important distinction, this is what we call a mitigation plan, a pre-disaster mitigation plan to, to, for the community to take stock of what it can do to <coughs> reduce its vulnerability. It is not an emergency response plan. You already have such a plan, every community does. It's, uh, there's a program across the street called the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, or SEMP, C-E-M-P, which the town participates in, and I believe the fire chief is responsible for managing. So that's in place already. There are a few areas where there could be some overlap between the two, but the main thing, if you want to switch the slide, the main thing is to, to distinguish this is, is we are looking at mitigating hazards before they occur. Uh, and that's why FEMA uh, calls this pre-disaster mitigation. It's thinking about ways in which the community can make itself less vulnerable to make itself more resilient. Uh, and we, if you look at those two questions at the bottom of the slide in yellow, what preventative actions are being taken now to reduce future risks and damages in the community? And what additional actions could be taken in the future. And that's really what the, the core of this plan is, to assess what your baseline is now and think about what additional things you could do to make the town more resilient. So the whole idea of this national program that FEMA put in place is to try to break or at least interrupt this constant cycle of disaster, <coughs> rebuild, disaster, rebuild. And every time you see the word rebuild there, think lots of dollars being put in both by the private property owners and the insurance programs, the, the flood insurance programs, which are taxpayer uh, subsidized. So they really wanted to get ahead of this cycle a little bit, seeing that this is, has been going on for many decades in some parts of the country, of course, more, more than others. What do we mean by hazard mitigation? Well, it's not a single methodology or a single approach, uh, but it's kind of an umbrella term uh, that could encompass a number of different uh, tactics. This is just a quick laundry list of some of the categories of actions that communities can take that will help mitigate natural hazards. Prevention can often be just by starting out looking at your land use and your zoning and your codes and figuring out, can you get out of harm's way to begin with? Can you not put insensitive development in places that you pretty much know are going to be subject to hazards based on history, et cetera. Property protection of physically protecting property, things like elevating in flood zones and that sort of thing. Public education, part of it is really important that you know, people who actually own the properties, whether they're small businesses or homeowners, that they can do what they can, you know, as much as they can to be aware of the hazards and on their own properties uh, mitigate them. Natural resources protection, and this is the one where we talk, often people use the term green infrastructure these days, or nature-based solutions, using mother nature to the best advantage to help us mitigate this. So protecting our wetlands and our buffer zones and our floodplains and letting them do the job they're supposed to be doing to help buffer the impacts on our developed areas. Structural <coughs> projects, and now you start to get into some of the areas where uh, you may need to put in place projects that will change the drainage pattern, change the storm drain in infrastructure to essentially make up for past problems that have caught up with you and that, that you need a sort of a cumulative change to some of your infrastructure. And in some of those potential drainage projects that could potentially be funded by FEMA grants when you have an approved plan. And finally, emergency services protection. You want to make sure that the capabilities the town has through its fire and police and public works and other emergency facilities, that those themselves are not subject to damage and that they aren't the first thing that gets taken out because if they get taken out, then they can't help everyone else in the community. So how did this plan get developed? Basically, the town coordinated the plan 
through a hazard mitigation team that's made up of multiple town departments and uh, we have the coordinator for the team right there helping me with the slides. Um, I cannot say enough about, uh, and I probably this is not news to this board, uh, the competency and professionalism of everyone who came to this, these meetings from the town. This has been a really wonderful town to work with. At MAPC, we work with a lot of communities, uh, and Arlington has been outstanding in coming forward and putting up the ideas and giving us the data and information we needed to put together this plan and make it useful for the town. So as, as your consultant, more or less, uh, we put together uh, the plan based on the information and uh, input we got from the committee. Uh, and then in the process, there are two public meetings, one of which we, we held back in June at the Senior Center, which has some pretty interesting participation there. And the second one is this very one tonight. Uh, and it's the, the second plan, the second meeting occurs at the point in where we have a draft plan available. So the plan is, I have brought a couple of hard copies, that, but more importantly, it's up on the town's <coughs> website. So folks not only in this room, but anyone who's watching at home um, can, can take a look at this plan and see if they have any questions or comments about it. The next steps in the process is that once the, we've gone through the review process of this draft, the plan will be submitted to MEMA and then to FEMA in sequence for their review and approval to make sure from their perspective the plan meets all of their technical requirements and they're pretty specific about what they require. This gives you a kind of a graphic view if you look clockwise around the numbers, the, the steps that uh, are involved in producing the plan. And we've worked our way all the way around the yellow items up to the red one where we are today. So we've done identifying the hazards, identifying and mapping critical facilities in the town, uh, identifying risks and vulnerabilities. Uh, we have our first public meeting, as I said, in June. Uh, then looked at the existing mitigation that you have in town already, what's the baseline that you have in place already, and then developed a set of recommended mitigation measures, which is really the heart of the plan. So we're now doing the second public meeting. We'll have outreach to stakeholders, <coughs> and then, as I've mentioned, the last step will be MEMA and FEMA review for the plan. So just a little bit of a, a very high-level tour of what's in the plan. We map and identify hazards starting with federal and state, information and then quickly drilling down to local information that comes to us mostly from the team members. Um, we look at the state hazard mitigation plan. One of the things that's an outstanding piece in this plan is a very thorough inventory of what we call critical facilities. And um, we have 106 of those that were identified by the local team. You, obviously we're not going to read this list just to give you a flavor. Uh, lots of different kinds of facilities and each of these is actually on a map as well. And there's a map. And this map here, um, you, oh, you're not going to be able to see a lot of detail at this scale, uh, but not only does it have all the critical facilities, there are the little green dots speckled throughout the town, uh, but you'll see some of the FEMA floodplain areas listed here in some of the blue and orange co color. So you can see where the areas that are more subject to potential flooding, for instance. The town, however, go, went beyond just looking at FEMA mapping and identify where there are local areas of drainage and flooding problems that you know, you've actually experienced. And they came up with this list of about eight different sites subject to local, localized flooding. And also, because it's an all hazards plan, uh, they looked at the brush fire risk and found a couple sites there as well. Those are also mapped. Here's an example of some of the kind of data we put into the plan. We look at uh, one of the most recent the severe flooding incidents, which was in 2010 in the spring. Uh, and this is a hydrograph that shows the level of the nearest uh, stream that we could find this information for on the Alewife Brook. Uh, and it shows in the months, months of March and up to early April, a couple of different major storm events where this like went off the scale and you had like levels of, of, of the river that we haven't seen in decades. So just documenting what the hazards are, the degree, quantifying it where we can. We're looking beyond just flooding, though, at a host of other hazards. We're looking at extreme heat, at earthquakes, earthquake zones, um, at drought. And of course, just 2016, we actually had a pretty significant drought, which we hadn't had one that big since the early 80s. So we, that's one of those wake-up calls. You don't get them that often. When you suddenly do get one, it, it can be a big deal. And you remember, yeah, we can get droughts, can't we? Yes. Uh, we were actually lucky. 2016 was pretty significant, but it was only about a year, not even a full year. Had it gone on longer, it would have been, we would still be talking about it today. Uh, extreme precipitation, that last one there. Um, what we're looking at there also, I'll, I'll mention, is uh, the effects of climate change. We've heard several speakers earlier tonight. 
many of these hazards that you've already historically been subjected to are likely to be getting worse or more severe with the impacts of climate change, especially severe storm events. Um, so that's another thing that this, although FEMA doesn't literally include climate change in their plan because it is a federal plan, right? We can actually talk about those, those data and put that in there as well. Finally, this is a, a, a part of the analysis, uh, just an example of a, um, a computer run that we did using FEMA's own software they call Hazus, Hazard <coughs> US, that estimates the financial damages from different scenarios of hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods, and how just basically looking at the building base in a community and coming up with it, and they have uh, computer modeling, basically, that gives you estimates. And you can see for some of these, of course, they would be very high, although those are very high events that you wouldn't have very, very likely to have in town, but it gives, you, it gives you a range of possibilities, including a certain worst case. So the mitigation strategies. We basically started with a previous plan, and we looked at which of those measures have actually been implemented, and some of them had been, and which that had not yet been implemented. Did the team, did the local team, want to keep them, carry them through and in, into the new plan? So there's a whole list of, of measures uh, that they did, and then they reprioritized and came up with cost estimates. Go ahead. And so the next two slides, again, we're not going to read all these. It's just to give you a flavor, and you can read them at your leisure. And these are actually in the plan as well, of course. But these are examples of the, of the major kinds of recommendations for these, this category here is for flooding and stormwater. And then we have a, a number of measures for some of the other hazards, winter hazards, wildfire, drought, et cetera. So they're all in the plan. Uh, each of those measures has a, a cost range estimate. It has the local department that would be responsible for it and a time range for it you know, over the five-year plan. So where we are at the final steps in the process, we have a draft plan. There's the, for what it's worth, there is on the slide the, the, the link to it. Um, if, if folks can see this at home, maybe they can find it, right? Uh, and. Um, uh, we're asking that if there's any comments or questions folks have about this, to, to submit them to Emily Sullivan by February 10th. Uh, after that, we will submit the plan to uh, MEMA and FEMA for review, and we'll be in the home stretch. Just as a heads up, we're not asking for an action tonight from this board, but when it comes back from FEMA and FEMA approved, approved at that point, you'll be asked to simply vote to adopt the plan, the, 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 the approved plan, because FEMA likes to see that there's a nice formal into the process that the, that the leadership of the community, <coughs> the chief elected officials, are actually aware of the plan and actually sort of put their, their, their stamp of adoption on it. So you'll see that at some le little bit later point. And with that, um, if you have any questions. I'll start with my colleagues. Mr. Kiro. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, this is fascinating. This is one of these uh, types of agenda items, which is torturous to my wife, because she'll be sitting there trying to read, and I'll be, hey, listen to this, listen to this. Yeah, right. A lot of nuggets in this, um, right. this report, I really um, appreciate. Um, I sent along to Ms. Wright uh, a few questions um, yes. after, I, after I read it. I appreciate right. you addressing one of them, because I was curious, uh, in the, um, the plan, there is a definition in, of um, hazards of, as being natural and uh, man-made, and I was, thinking of some of the things we've experienced in Arlington with the, the failure of MWRA infrastructure and the need to supply bottled water and uh, right. also the threat of gas leaks, which I think has been hanging over us uh, since we you know, saw our neighbors to the north. So thank you for addressing that at, sure. at the uh, outset. One of my other questions, though, had been um, amongst the, the types of natural hazards that you outlined, why are microbursts not included? That's something that we have experienced here. Right, and uh, actually uh, I did see your comments in uh, my email this morning, and so my thought with that is we, we would and should include microbursts if we have any information about have they've, where, where and when they've occurred. It just didn't seem to come up in the meetings, but in fact if they have happened, it's, that's why this is still a draft plan. We can go back and get yeah. that information and add it in, because that's a category of hazard that we would normally include. It's just that in the discussions prior up to this point, they specifically hadn't been brought up. Okay. So we can do a double check on that and, and, and add those in. Yeah. Okay. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, that's, that's great. That's great. Fantastic. And I think I had sent along a couple of observations I had for some areas that might need some updating on 
tornadic activity. Yes, th that's um, right. And I noticed a couple other things too that I'll, maybe I can get to you, Emily. Like, yeah, if you have any further updates, so feel free. This, that's why we have a draft and a comment. For yeah, you yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's difficult with the, the, the list of. Um, it's a moving target, but this we This large sure list of critical facilities, they change all of the time. Yep. So I, I see some things that have probably changed since the list right. was put together. So. That's why you redo the plan every five years or so. Can you imagine how much changes in five yeah. years, right? Yeah. But that's great. Thank you very much. Really You're appreciate well. this. Mr. Hurd? Sorry if I missed this, but can you just explain what the role of the 106 critical facilities is in the plan? Yes, that's a good question because that list is actually, I like to say it has apples, oranges, and pears on it. It's not all the same thing. Yeah. You can br basically break down the items on that list into three kind of buckets or categories. One is facilities that provide utility to the town, especially in its ability to respond to a disaster. So that would include <coughs> your you know, emergency operations center, police and fire, and public works facilities, and communications tower, and that's all of those sorts of things. Then there's the second category of facilities that might require assistance, especially because they have vulnerable populations. So that might have elderly housing, daycare centers, schools, and that sort of thing. And then there's a third category that's general infrastructure, things like dams, critical bridges, uh, uh, things of that sort. So those, all of those are in that list because they're critical, but you're, you make a good point for different reasons, actually. Sure. That's it. Um, I was wondering if there's any way we could incorporate, I know you have um, some verbiage in here regarding sanitary sewer overflows, but the um, remaining three CSO outfalls um, that we have that discharge into the Al White Brook, um, it seems to me that um, perhaps that's something that could and should be included in this. Originally, before I even got on the board, um, I think there were like either seven or 11 when we first started out. And the MWRA did embark on um, a program where every 10 years they went and got a variance in <coughs> Cambridge. And they so slowly eliminated um, the majority of the CSO outfall that um, mm -hmm. experienced the discharges into the brook. Um, but that's sort of stalled. So my question would be, is this something that could be included at least for consideration? Um, and you don't have to answer that tonight unless you know the answer. Well, I would say that, you know, it's one of those infrastructure questions, but there could be a link to natural hazards in the sense that if it's high rainfall events that activate those overflows, then there's a, there's a connection there that makes that a relevant thing to consider. Because that's exactly what um, happened, like from and, the 20... And, and, yeah, so just like the other point, if we get that information from folks on the team, mm -hmm. uh, and we can maybe go back and just put that ask out, I'd be yeah. glad to put that into the plan. Put, you know, just a quick mm -hmm. characterization. Of, are, are there a certain number of sites? Where are they? Uh, and, and the question is, in, in terms of the plan's recommendations, uh, that category is not likely to be something the town is going to take an action about because I know that's something that really is under MWRA's auspices to, to do something about, and it's part of their long-term CSO control plan that's under the court order that goes all the way back to Boston Harbor. So there's a lot of connections there, uh, but it doesn't hurt to refer to something like that in your plan, even if you're not going to end up at the end of the day having a specific local town action related to, to that. Because yeah. it, it stalled out about 10 years ago, MWRA. Okay. And, and my um, sort of another tactic on how to address it is um, through this um, hazard mitigation plan, um, yes, it's MWRA, but it's also the cities of Somerville and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's an avenue there. And then um, I don't know if it's appropriate in here, but I know going all the way back to the citations you gave, um, there's always a lot of debate around the um, Amelia Earhart Dam, um, what the pr procedures and policies are when they do release it. Um, Arlington, from what I've been told that by people who are well versed in this, we really bear the brunt of it. It used to be over, I think, in Winchester, Horn Pond. Is, is that where they used to get a lot of right. funding? Yeah. But that has gotten mitigated um, by, uh, was it town of Winchester or uh, city of Auburn? Uh, Winchester did work on the Aboriginal River. Winchester, which, uh, okay. Um, some of their I don't know if that's something, because um, I know it has detrimental effects in terms of when we have the 100 year storms, the three CSOs discharge, and all that goes into the backyards along Boulevard, Lafayette, Sunnyside, et cetera. Um, and then I think I heard from uh, you by uh, questions from my colleagues that this is something that will be revisited. Um, maybe there's sort of a placeholder, um, whether it's in this plan or in the process. Um, something that we haven't um, even foreseen yet that may come up in the future 
obviously that's something that's doable that can be worked into this if, if applicable and um, if it follows the framework of being applied in this way. So I'm saying we have that just in case there's a future placeholder somewhere process in there. I know I'm not, I'm not artfully uh, phrasing uh, no, that. No, no, I, I think I understand that. And I could also suggest that uh, another place for this issue to be considered further on is, uh, as you know, you've completed a municipal vulnerability preparedness project, which is a little broader in its, what it's looking at. It's not so constrained by FEMA requirements. And um, it can look at these longer term trends and it can, it can and does include the impacts of climate change as rain, rainstorms become more you know, stronger and you may have higher, higher tides and higher storm surges. All of those get considered in that effort. And so that may be the real place where you can have the, uh, the, the leverage to uh, think about some of these bigger picture, longer term issues that, that aren't quite so fitting within the FEMA framework exactly, but are important to the town. Okay, honestly, that poorly phrased question, there really is a reason that I'm asking it, just in case, but we'll, we'll get further down the road. Um, any else, my colleagues, Mr. DeCourse? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a few comments. First, I wanna thank Ms. Sullivan um, there was a resident who sent a question in over the weekend and, and the answer had to do with the difference between the, the hazard mitigation plan and the comprehensive emergency management plan. And thank you for responding to her so promptly and uh, giving a, a, a real good uh, discussion as to what the differences are. And maybe that can go on the website as well in terms of one is before natural disaster, the other is while we're in the middle of it or, or, or afterwards. So. Thank you for that. Um, just a question, I know this plan was funded through a MEMA grant. Is, is this necessary to qualify for MEMA funding as well, in, in addition to um, FEMA grants? In, in the future, in other words, we're doing this plan partly because it allows us to qualify for future FEMA right. grant funding. Is that required at the state level as well to have, to have an updated plan? Uh, no, but this is a FEMA requirement. Um, the only thing I'll say is that, that when FEMA grants are come into Massachusetts, <coughs> they are actually administered by MEMA. Okay. So, and, and so it was a MEMA it's grant. It's all really part and parcel of the same process. Okay, but it was a MEMA grant that actually funded the study, wasn't it? That's right. So in, in, here's a case where it's not completely an unfunded mandate. They say you should do a plan and we'll give you a grant to cover 75% at least of the cost, because all FEMA grants cover 75%. Okay, yes. oh, good. thank That's you. Right. And, and just a question on the, on the draft, and, and there are a number, it, it's online as you said, and, and there are a number of the, the various hazards that are identified. Within the areas, and then there are a number that are high priority and, and, and high estimated cost, are they laid out by in order of this is the most important one, or is it, is it just laid out by areas across the town that have been identified? I don't believe that they've been prioritized against each other. These are all like the a fairly short list of the top concern areas in across the whole town, okay. but not necessarily relative to each other. Like if there's a list of one through nine, it's not a list in order of priority. Okay, okay. And, and this may be a question for the town manager. Some of the projects I see here are actually we're in the planning stages, so the DPW facility is here as a high priority. It's also in the capital plan. Is there any <coughs> coordination that you see going forward to that to try to coordinate CPA capital plan in the in the needs that are identified here? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, going back to the last hazard mitigation plan, there were capital planning requests that were made coming out of that. So I know that DPW, working with Jenny and Emily, will they, they will do that coordination. Now that we have the CPA, as compared to the last time, we'll have more funding resources that might be available uh, okay. to, to implement the recommended projects. Great. Thank you. And, and just a specific question on, on land protection and flooding hazards. One of the measures is to identify uh, acquiring open space parcels. Are those just in general, or is it, are there any um, specific um, uh, recommendations that will come out of the, the plan? So this plan didn't identify specific parcels. It's, pro <coughs> it's, it's proposing or it's recommending that you use your open space acquisition, which you do for many purposes, historic and recreation, that one of the factors that you consider is that some of this open space land will help to absorb floodwaters. 
And so um, at, this would be something you, I would say you would actually implement in the course of your open space plan and your, and your ongoing open space acquisition program. So it gives you that priority. But it wasn't prescriptive in this hazard mitigation plan about this exact parcel or that exact parcel. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, Mrs. Warden. Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. Thank you, Madam Chairman, um, for the opportunity to speak. And thank you, Ms. Sullivan, for your answer to my questions about conservation considerations, and to Mr. DeCourcy for his very important questions. Um, this hazard plan tonight should help prevent harm to people and properties from natural and man-made hazards. Arlington's flood problems will get worse as climate change progresses. Rainfall associated with the worst storms in our region is now 71% greater than it was 50 years ago. And so, thank you to Metropolitan Area Planning Council and other creators of um, this hazard mitigation plan for their very helpful maps. Unfortunately, the creators have done a good um, a good job checking boxes, but as um, regards providing imp improvements for protection of people and properties, not so much. Many important factors are ignored and there are errors. There is a lot of repetitive boilerplate. In Table 31, Arlington High School is cited as having zero infrastructure flood risk and Monotomy Preschool is cited for significant flood risks, but Monotomy Preschool is inside Arlington High School, so that makes no sense. Another mistake. The report said that Arlington recreated the town common. Well, no. Arlington has never had a common. The only land that might have resembled a common, Russell Green, was entirely paved over for a parking lot long ago. The report says that public participation is very important for this plan, but prior to tonight, there has only been one such public session, just one in seven years. A much greater concern neglected in the hazard plan is the failure of town leaders to prioritize hazard mitigation over attempted de developer-friendly zoning changes for dense residential development, removing usable open space, which in many cases would worsen hazards. Zoning should be used to reduce hazards, but recently town leaders have been doing just the opposite. Fortunately, they have so far been stopped by town meeting. The report indicates the importance of trees in avoiding heat island effects, that are dangerous to our seniors. But the planning department plans to remove shade trees from Arlington Center to facilitate a lucrative landscape contract. In fact, there is a tree hearing tomorrow where a plea will be made to save the trees. Flooding problems are most severe in the Millbrook Valley. The firm Weston and Sampson determined that Arlington should develop a capital improvement plan um, Formula Brook essentially so that it can run all the way to Mystic <coughs> Lake without being blocked by the undersized covert at Arlington High School. That causes the frequent, expensive, dangerous backup flooding problems upstream. Solving the Millbrook's flooding problems would need the undersized covert for the Millbrook that runs beside, not under, the high school football field to be replaced or opened up daylightist, but the report completely ignores this. So the problem will go on and get worse. There is no plan, nothing to improve this, even though it is at the site of Arlington's biggest ever construction plan, the new Arlington High School. There is little or no mention of the FEMA designated floodways at Arlington High School fields and the large culvert under the high school that may need to be redirected or expanded. It carries stormwater from 400 million square feet of watershed 
from Massachusetts Avenue under the high school to Mill Brook. There are no permits or order of conditions for this construction, nor have any even been applied for. The report ignores this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Warren. <laughs> Um, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning. If anybody um, has any remarks that they want to officially enter into the record, you can leave it with Ms. Marr and or if you feel like you didn't want to get up and say anything or you thought of something later, you can um, get them to Ms. Marr who will get them over to um, Mr. Pillsbury or, or Ms. Sullivan. Okay. Um, Ms. Ray, did you want to? I just wanted to close out our section and just thank very much all of you for listening to the presentation for all of the questions that you asked particularly those in advance but also the productive discussion this evening um, and also of course to Martin and Emily I really appreciate them ushering through this process and particularly Emily's ability to <coughs> organize the internal team to help with this whole entire process we really rely on our partners at DPW and engineering in order to make this all happen um, as well as, of course, our public safety and other personnel in the community who really have a hand in carrying this uh, plan forward. So thank you to all of all, all of you. And, and, and I just want to check. I didn't realize that this was a public meeting. Um, yes. That you all are calling it a public meeting. Um, so I don't know if anyone else came that wanted to speak. You could just so could thank you. you. That was all. Okay. Sorry. It was I, I apologize. I wouldn't have had that confusion. So. No, Name and address. Hi, I'm Zavid Pretzer at 44 Grove Street. Uh, and I just wanted to say with reference to this plan that I'm really glad that it's talking about the DPW having fl flood water storage because flooding uh, affects a lot of the homes along Brattle Street and Grove Street and it's an increasing problem. And so anything we can do to mitigate, mitigate that I think is very valuable. And I do think as part of that, um, I would appreciate if the relevant parties considered options for increasing the ability for water to flow under Grove Street. The culvert there uh, gets backed up during floods, and so if there's anything we can do to sort of remove that choke point or increase the capacity for water to flow under Grove Street could be very helpful for homes along Grove and Brattle Streets. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And Ms. <coughs> Sullivan is taking all of this down, so I know. <laughs> Just name and address. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, Arn Franzen, 81 Oakland Avenue. Um, <clears throat> I think I haven't looked at the report. I haven't seen it online. I've just took a, just um, thumbed through it very quickly. Um, it looks like a lot of work has gone into it. I can, I can see that there's any number of issues that could be addressed. Um, but I, I agree with Mr. DeCourcy's evaluation of my priorities. I don't see the priorities here. We've listed a number of issues a number of things that could be addressed, should be addressed. <clears throat> Some of them are ranked high, medium, and low. There are a lot of high priority projects here. I'd like to see a prioritization of the projects. In one of the slides, we talked about the number of, the number of uh, um, flooding issues. I'd like to see a prioritization there. It'd also be helpful in terms of the recommendations of the report if there was more of an aspect of a report card to it. Um, the last report was done in 2012. If you look at um, section seven in the report where it lists all the changes that have happened since 2012, in 2012 there were a large number of high priority projects that had to be addressed. And if you look at what's been happened since then, there's been often no action or nothing's been done. So it'd be good to know what is the town doing? What is the plan? What it, what's, what's the report card? You know, where do we stand? in terms of the process. So um, I think that would be a, a good component to include in the recommendations. All right, thank you. And, and perhaps um, similar to what we do with um, <coughs> other endeavors, um, maybe there's some sort of like a matrix chart that lists everything in the different categories. I, I, I assume that's something that you all already have a handle on it. Um, but I do agree with that. So um, I think you said you weren't looking for approval, so uh, a move receipt by Mr. Kiro. So Is there a second by Mr. Hurd? Any further questions or comments? If not, a motion by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Um, next we have the de debrief and follow up from joint meeting with redevelopment board on 1-13-2020. Mr. 
just going to let them clear out. <coughs> jumped back to December 2nd's meeting. I, I, I don't know what happened. Oh, oh. Mr. Chap Town Manager, Mr. Chapelain. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. So provided for the board's review and comment is a memorandum uh, sort of restating in a, a calendar format the process that was discussed between the Redevelopment Board and the Select Board of the joint meeting that happened several weeks ago, as well as an updated outreach plan, uh, also incorporating the recommendations and suggestions of both boards. Uh, so I, not to read the memos to you if the board has any questions, comments, concerns, uh, or changes that it would like to, to be seen, uh, we, we'd be happy to, to discuss those. Mr. Hurd? Just one comment. I, I don't think we flushed this out at our joint meeting, but we had talked about reviewing the article, so we'd, we'd review the zoning articles. I am not convinced I can be that it's a good idea for both boards to take votes. Is that what this this uh, timeline is saying, that both boards are going to take votes? So we would take a vote based on for on the zoning articles as proposed? So I, my, my recollection of the conversation was that uh, the board, either board could certainly reserve its right to take a vote, but that the preferred course would be comment right. on it, but not you know, not having, a, again, a dueling motion or something that would be rivaling right. the, the sort of the, the main board's motion on it. So if we can just clean up that yeah. where it says idea, review yeah. and votes on recommended actions, yeah. I just, <coughs> my opinion would be that we shouldn't be taking the dueling votes. I think we can come up with, you know, our comments and yeah. summarize for town meeting what our individual collective thoughts were, but to have, oh, you know, the redevelopment board voted three to two in favor, the select board four to one against, I think it's confusing for town meeting. So if I add some language that suggests that votes, it's recommended that votes only be taken in each board's respective jurisdiction. Is that some, something along those lines? Yeah. And I'm, I, I think we should open up for input too, but that's just my feeling. Mr. Dunn? So I guess um, I would prefer that at the right time when the board, when when the ARB, in particular on zoning, when the ARB is ready for the select board to give an opinion, and the select board is similarly ready to give an opinion, I would prefer the select board take that vote and make and, 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 and make that case. Um, I'm definitely not saying that we should be doing it for everything, and I'm not, and we shouldn't do it when we're, when we're not comfortable, and we shouldn't do it when on their ter you know on their turf, so to speak, when they don't invite us. <coughs> but um, there are things that. I think that the, the leadership of the select board can really help push across the finish line. And I really think that uh, this is, I, I feel like the reason we're trying to do this process is because that was missing last year from some really important uh, things. And if we talk about the housing crisis the, the presentation, I really think that that is something that we as a select board should take a position on when the time is right. I'm, I very much respect the caution that you're feeling, but I don't want to say don't vote. I want to say vote when the time's right. Would that be something that gets fleshed out in the meeting between the chairs to say, all right, as you look at the actual articles, you say these are the ones that... I think so. And I also yeah. think that, it, like, at least in my experience, both on this... I'll, I'll give you a few different examples. One is um, the select board and the finance committee, which I've experienced from both sides. And then there is uh, the long-range planning committee and the school committee and the finance committee and the retirement board. There's this like iterative dance where like one board has a conversation where you know you talk about like there's a public hearing and you can see where the sense of the board is. And then another board has a come up where's oh yeah where the selectmen leaning and stuff like that. And you kind of like close in. And uh, if you get to this place where you aren't going to reach consensus, then one <coughs> party or the other you know would appropriately I think bow out. But I don't think so. Yes, a joint meeting is a venue on that. But I think about for instance um, like on the override. You know we didn't have a joint meeting with the finance committee, but we were dancing. Sure. If I can just provide one thing that might be of some comfort to the board, um, there can only be one legally operative motion in a zoning matter. So under Chapter 48, only the ARB's motion can actually be before town meeting. 
as the operative vote. So in some ways, that does provide some clarity and security. There have been occasions, to my recollection, where a body has commented, I think in particular the Finance Committee, in support of adoption of, for example, a local option. And so we could look at the uh, models used by the Finance Committee in those circumstances for um, language that might make sure that it's clear that, we're that no one's infringing on somebody's turf or confusing town meeting. Mr. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and just on, on the memorandum, I, I think part of the word board is used interchangeably yeah, yeah. between select board and redevelopment <laughs> boards. I think that needs to be fleshed out in terms of who's doing who's yeah. doing one or if it's the respective boards. And, and um, so I think that 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 may clarify things. And, and um, I think one of the, what we had discussed at the joint meeting too was separating. Like the joint, the meeting that's going to take place between our, our chair and, and the chair of the redevelopment board is really for worn articles this year so that are submitted by the 10 registered voter articles probably, as opposed to <coughs> what may be developed next fall in, into the winter. And I think that's the iterative, I think you called it the dance, <laughs> Mr. Dunn, but that, I think that's where the redevelopment board is probably looking for feedback from us. But I, I agree with Mr. Hurd to the respect that I don't want to get down into the weeds of every yeah. single item that's being proposed because that's that's not our function. But I, I don't think that was the intent. I think it was at a higher level of the, for the support. Mr. Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if I'm hearing what you're all saying, I, I think you're actually saying similar things. I, I think Mr. Hurd was suggesting he doesn't want to take detailed <laughs> votes on zoning articles. And Mr. Dunn is saying he'd like to vote support for, or consider support for things the ARB are doing. And I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Uh, I think that's going to work. Yeah. Okay. I think I, my uh, point is I don't want to confuse town me. Yeah. And I think yeah. Attorney Heim has clarified that. And I also, I mean, both the boards and the citizens who are active with regards to these zoning changes with the year for or against, you know, time is important. So I think people, we just want to make people understand that we're going to review it and we're going to comment on it. But you know, if you are for or against the zoning articles, you put your presentation, and you know, you're going to get the most bang for your buck at the ARB, and you know, vice versa for the the Warren articles here, just so people are aware of that. Yeah. Uh, and to be crystal clear, I mean, not, not to beat the dead horse, what I would expect would be voting on is whether or not we concur in the recommended action, mm -hmm. not the article itself. So it's a vote of concurrence question of whether we concur to, to, to avoid the, 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 the dueling situation. The, the and that assumes that we're going to review it. After we're not going to put for, we're not going to put forward an alternative set of language. I wouldn't anticipate that right. we're putting yeah. it forward, mm -hmm. ever putting forward alternative language. And I guess I would add just to repeat what um, I had said at the joint mm -hmm. meeting is um, it's similar to what my colleagues have all commented on. What we're discussing here in terms of any joint um, conversations and concurrence agreement, et cetera, um, to me that would be a rarity. Um, uh, we could go a year or two that um, there really isn't anything, and each board can basically sustain itself and, and move forward without the other. I, I just wanted to have something around um, the Warren articles we just went through and any future common global um, concerns of the town, I don't know, vis-a-vis -vis Mugar, if that, you know, um, I know when I first got on the board, there were several boards and commissions that um, even even though one had sort of the main bailiwick of, of being the reporting body, board, commission, committee, um, we did bring in um, other town um, boards and committees as well as um, our counterparts over in Belmont. So, so that's what I'm thinking for this, because um, I agree we don't want to get really bogged down and um, and, and I would anticipate, however, the process, and it'll be a future chair that's planning for the goal setting meeting in July, and you know how th that'll be a good meeting and, and formed that way. Um, but it really uh, setting out, um, I think we need to have the discussion, see where it goes. But I think you're getting the sense from the board in terms of uh, what our feelings are. So I'll stop there. Uh, Mr. Kiro. Yeah, the only other um, comment <coughs> I would have on this, which is a different topic, is I, I noticed that this timetable has um, 
July for a joint board mm -hmm. goal setting meeting and a timetable for more moving forward with the goals and then a, a fall joint board meeting to provide update on the goals three or four months I mean maybe there'd be movement on goals but I assume that, that that's a little is going to have to be a little bit flexible depending on what the timetable is um, that's set in July yeah that's a good point I, th I think that reads as though we were already into a cycle where goals had been established in the previous year so um, exactly. let's uh, make some uh, I can make an amendment to that yeah okay um, everybody all set I don't think we need a vote on that all set thank you so much um, we now go to agenda item 13 fiscal year 2020 quarterly budget report mr. Chapelain so I am going to turn that over to deputy town manager Sandy Pooler to deliver the report to the board Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you watching at home, I'm Sandy Pooler, Deputy <coughs> Town Manager. Um, the first thing I would like to do is uh, I noticed as I was going over the report that was sent to you that uh, I had inadvertently left out the general fund revenue pages. So I'm going to pass those out with oh, your permission. Oh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Um, the numbers are contained within the report, but the backup material is uh, what is being passed out now. No, I gave you five, so don't get it. Ashley, I have one. Better for you to have one. It's better for you to have one. Uh, and I will uh, update the electronic version, so tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, this is the second in our uh, new forms of quarterly budget <coughs> reports uh, to the Select Board and the Finance Committee. This was report, report was prepared by me and Ida Cody, uh, our comptroller. Uh, unfortunately, she had a family obligation and couldn't be here tonight. Um, but uh, I'm happy to represent us both. I think the news here is uh, very good. Generally, uh, everything is on target. We are 50% way of our way through the year, and this report shows that on the expense side in the general fund, we have expended about 57% or encumbered 57% of uh, people's budgets. And on the revenue side, we have um, collected about 47%. Just on the face of it, those numbers might not seem good, but they actually are. They're fine. <laughs> uh, because there are a number of things, as explained in the memo, I'm not going to go through every line of the memo, uh, that show that for many departments, uh, particularly those with some very large accounts like public works with our trash accounts and and facilities with our fuel accounts and so forth they encumber those funds early on in the year so on the reports that come out of munis it looks as if uh, it shows that those resources have been accounted for either directly spent or encumbered so that they don't inadvertently get spent later uh, on uh, things other than what they're meant for um, there, so there are explanations of s some of the major deviations in this report. If any department budget was off by uh, more than 10%, or in a couple of cases where I thought the numbers were big enough, if it was less than 10%, we provided an explanation. Um, I will not go through <coughs> each of those. I will say we did try to present this in a format for the first time where we listed the departments on the town side in alphabetical order as opposed to the order they show up in our accounting system, since I think most people are better at alphabets than they are at accounting systems. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we separated out some other things, like our big uh, accounts, like debt and uh, insurance accounts for health insurance and property insurance, Minuteman and pensions, and then all the smaller warrant articles, and then uh, went through uh, the revenue. A couple of things I do want to say about revenue, why it is at 40% instead of 50%, uh, two factors. One is that our biggest source of revenue is our uh, property taxes. And as you all know uh, from uh, seeing property tax bills go out in the past, the first two bills of the year are estimated bills, and the second two are actual bills. And those actual bills invariably are higher than the estimated bills. Um, so. Um, and this year, we'll also see those uh, end-of-the-year bills have the override uh, on them, what the first two bills didn't. The second factor in the second part of the year that brings in more revenue is that's when we get the bulk of our motor vehicle excise uh, revenue in. 
So um, I've looked back at previous years uh, at the same time and what our tax revenue has come in and as a percentage and it's consistent with what, what we've been doing in past years. So I just want to assure you that uh, that is good and we are on target. Um, I will also note that um, our interest rate collection is um, what we get on our earnings is very good. Um, we budget $65,000 and so far we've taken in $406,000. Um, the $65,000 comes from what we actually brought in about 10 years ago at the low, at the trough of our interest collection. So that's one of the reasons we keep that estimate low. Um, but it does mean that we are um, building up the resources to replenish our free cash every year uh, by having a gap in that. What does a, a collection rate of 626 percent mean under interest? That means that 406,000 is 626 percent of 65,000. Okay. In other words, um, say that one more time. I didn't write it down. Sorry. That 406,000 is 626 percent of 65,000. Okay. In other words, it's about six times 65,000. All right. Um, 36, yep. That is the, the, um, the general fund. The enterprise funds all uh, are uh, collecting uh, revenue and spending at, at the rates we'd expect to see them. The only one that I'm a little bit concerned about is um, that the AYCC is is doing a bang-up job um, re responding to some very real needs out in the community. So they've seen more and more people coming in. It means that more and more there's sufficient revenue coming in to meet their expenses, um, but they are running ahead uh, of what they're authorized to spend during the year. So we will, we've will we been talking about, uh, in other words, they can't spend more than town meeting authorized them to. At some, some point, we, will, we may have to do something about that. Um, I just point that out because it's the only one that I think is <coughs> is something that we really need to look at at this point. I have been talking with Christine Bongiorno about it and Christine Legere, so I think we're on top of it. Um, but that is, of all these other numbers, the only ones that uh, are somewhat inconsistent from what they've been before because there are growing needs in the community for these, those kind of services, and fortunately we've been able to provide them and collect the revenue for them. Um, Pages four and five are all the number details for the general fund, uh, and page six are um, the summaries of the, of the enterprise funds, and then the rest of the report are the munis reports. The munis reports, because they're from munis, are not in alphabetical order, they're in accounting order. Um, but I think for, for most people, uh, the first six pages are, are where most of the valuable information is gonna be. With that, I would be happy to answer any questions people may have. Mr. Hurd. I have one question about the hotel revenue. Yeah. It looks like we have about 100% of what was projected. Is that, does that mean occupancy in our hotels is higher than we thought, or is there other sources? I think, the, 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 I think the hotel in, in East Arlington expanded, <coughs> and so what our previous estimate was based on what we saw as a pattern, and now what we're seeing is there larger than they were, and so they're just bringing in more revenue than they had in the past. Okay. We have such limited hotels, I didn't, wouldn't expect that one to be ahead of schedule, but that, that's good. Yeah. Any other questions? Mr. DeCourcy? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of questions on, on revenue. On, and I, you already mentioned the investment interest being up so much, but the, the penalties and in interest, it, it, what is what's included in that revenue? I, I know it's you know, late tax payments and, and that's exactly what it is. It's, okay, it's, it's a late it's late tax payments. Okay, all right. Um, and then on the um, licenses and permits, and this is the first year you're doing it, so I don't know if this there's a way to um, does that indicate any trend in in terms of if you've looked at prior years? In terms of what building has been in in the town in terms of building permit fees or is it and this may be an appropriate percentage at this time of year i'm just i'm just curious if it reflects any more or any less than what you've seen previously i do look at that every month um and um and do a a, a year-to-date comparison from over the last 10 years just and then graph it out and just take a look um 
I would say that uh, we are, and, and it can fluctuate a lot month to month depending on what projects come in, so it, it's not always smooth. I would say this year we are within a range of high uh, building and license permits that we've been in for about the last five or six years. We're a little bit behind where we were the previous year at this time, but we've had a, a period of about five or six years of heightened revenue from that area, which goes to show that the economy is booming and so forth. It also goes to show that at some point, if the economy cools down, that could dip again. So we're, we're kind of consistent, um, not, but it's not ever increasing either. Over the last few years, it kind of goes up and down a, a little bit, but we're, we're, in, we're in the maybe the seven good years. <laughs> okay, good. No, th thank you. And the last thing I want to say is in response to what you're saying about AYCC, it seems it, it, there's an incredible demand for their services, and I think it, it, while it may be reflected in higher expenses, that the need is there, and I, th I think we certainly should look into um, ways to, 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 to address that and, and um, you know, help to help them provide those services. And, and just sort of a follow-up on that, because I know <clears throat> intermittently over the years, and I think this might have been one of the years, um, using the AYCC, they do get sometimes one-time grants from the state, whether it's a supplemental bond or an actual appropriation. Does that also, is that something that you're also tracking and factors into that? When you come to the question of, as Mr. DeCourcy raised, um, is there a need for more services out there um, and there's truly no more money anywhere else? That's exactly what, what we've been talking about uh, with the director and with the, with the department head, is how to use all the resources because what you're seeing on this report is just what's in the enterprise fund and they do have other other funds that they can tap into. So that's part of the conversation we're having as we look at this going throughout the year. And I would just to expand on that, uh, perhaps around that particular issue, in having the conversation, um, sort of do a cost-benefit analysis of w what, if any, increased services are being offered, if they are being funded by the state, and if it is a, an only a one-time allocation and or follow-up to find out that that isn't the case, and then I would leave it to uh, Mr. Pooler and Ms. Bongiorno who, and whomever else to sort of say, um, how do these programs sustain themselves in the future? Uh, maybe it is, you know, increased funding from the state, but I certainly wouldn't rely on that. So you understand what I'm saying? <coughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, I, Mr. Chaplin. If I may, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I would add, I, the AYCC, uh, as far as I understand it, is, isn't looking for more general fund revenue. Uh, the issue is that th they make their best prediction at, the, at budget setting time every year of how much money they think they're going to spend and collect. And what they're hitting up against is the need to spend more than they've been allocated. If they spend more, they'll collect more because they'll bill for those services mm -hmm. or access those various pots of grant money or state uh, earmark money based on the populations that they're serving. And, and this actually has happened, I think, two or three, maybe two times over the past decade where they've just They've hit up against their uh, their appropriation cap. So just to, to put a fine point on it, this isn't a situation where they're coming back to the general fund looking for more tax money. They're just looking for appropriation flexibility. Okay. Um, move receipt by so moved. Mr. Carroll, seconded by Second. Mr. Dunn. Um, any further questions and comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn to move receipt. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Buller. <coughs> Uh, we now go to agenda item 14, town manager's budget presentation. Does anyone need a break? I don't know if you can hear my stomach testifying over here. I apologize. Uh, I, yeah. Sauce and liquids are too so crazy. It's like <laughs> trying to hide it. Yeah. <coughs> are we taking a break or we're oh, no, going right in? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. 
thank you. So I'm, I'll be cognizant of the fact that this is the third or fourth presentation the board has heard tonight, so I'll pay it the respect that it, it needs and deserves, but try not to, to linger too long. Uh, so if we go to the first slide, Doug. Uh, I'll start with what we do every year and talk um, a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight and talk about the budget process. How, how do we put together the budget and then what public process does it go through uh, for consideration and then ultimately approval by town meeting. Uh, I'll give an overview of the budget. We'll take a look at uh, projected revenues in FY21 versus FY20 and then do the same for expenditures. Uh, I'll talk about some highlights in this year's budget. Uh, I think particularly I want to highlight <clears throat> how this budget is really focused on maintaining the commitments that this board made in putting an override on the ballot in June of 2019. And I want to talk about the investments that this budget is proposing for general government. Uh, we then we'll move into a long-term outlook of where we see uh, the next three to five years uh, for the town's budget, uh, and then talk about the next steps as we really launch the public part of the budget process here tonight. Go to the next slide. Yeah. So I know the board knows this well, but for those here tonight or those watching on TV, uh, the town follows a fiscal year that runs from July 1 to June 30. So a fiscal year starts on July 1st, um, and <clears throat> that's all starting from the prior year's budget process. Uh, so then internally, starting in September, uh, we ask all departments to return their capital budget request to the town manager's office for processing through the capital planning committee. Then we similarly ask all departments for their operating budget requests for, uh, to be delivered to the town manager's office by November. And those are processed by the deputy town manager and the management analyst, all leading up to the delivery <laughs> of this, uh, this budget book here. Uh, and this budget book is due on January 15th. Uh, it's uh, part of the town manager act that it be delivered to the select board and finance committee on January 15th. Then. Uh, Late January, more like early February through April, the Finance Committee will hold hearings, public hearings, on all of these budgets and other financial warrant articles. In March, um, the Town Manager's Office puts together the annual budget and financial plan and provides that to the Select Board and the Finance Committee. We, we wait till March because that's when we get our updated health insurance numbers. In April, the Finance Committee uh, submits its report uh, to town meeting like mid to, mid to late April, but within hopefully a week's advance of the start of town meeting. <clears throat> in May, what we hope for is that town meeting adopts both the operating and capital budgets, and then we get back to the end or the start of the cycle and the fiscal year ends on June 30th and we start it all over again. <clears throat> so what are we looking at this year? We're currently in fiscal year 20, <clears throat> which Sandy just gave an update on, and the budget that we're talking about is the proposed FY21 budget. So what you see before you here are our projected revenues. These, are, these come from the long-range plan that has been reviewed by the long-range planning committee. I'll start with property tax. Um, you can see we're estimating an increase year over year of 2.8%. So that's basically 2.5% uh, um, under Proposition 2.5 and, and $600,000. Uh, $600,000, Sandy? Six, 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 yeah, six, yeah, 650, thank you, um, in new, uh, projected new growth. Local receipts, we've stayed with our tradition of increasing that line item by $100,000 a year. State aid, uh, you see we have, we're predicting a 2.8% increase. What you see here before you is what our projections were before the governor released his budget on January 22nd. Now, we do know that the governor released his budget then, and the numbers are not what are before you tonight. But <clears throat> in sticking with past precedent, we'll update the long-range plan, present it to the long-range planning committee on February 5th and then provide those numbers in a more updated fashion back to the board, finance committee, and so on. The good news is, not to bury the lead, <clears throat> we received significantly more Chapter 70 funding in the governor's budget than what we had predicted or projected uh, in this FY21 budget submission. <clears throat> Below that is school construction aid. Those are reimbursements from the old MSBA process, the SBAB, where they give us their share of debt service payments. You, know, you, you probably recall that that number has gone down, 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 as the town has retired debt associated with prior school building projects. Under that, you see our free cash allocation. Uh, for those um, not as, quite as familiar with this process, part of the long-range planning process for the town is appropriating 50% of the prior year's certified free cash as an operating revenue. So you can see this year it's going up by about $340,000 as free cash was certified at a higher amount than what was certified last year. Other funds represent overlay, uh, overlay surplus, so the money that we set aside every year for abatements and exemptions uh, by the assessor's office. 
We also ask the, board, uh, ask the Board of Assessors to tell us what they have extra. What, what have they not used and they can surplus and we can use as a revenue? And we program $200,000 a year as an operating revenue. Sometimes as we get further in the process, they may give us a different number, hopefully always higher than what we budgeted, uh, but we, <clears throat> we see what they have to say as they look at what abatements they have before them. And then finally, uh, last year we did not make a withdrawal from the override stabilization fund as an operating revenue, but in FY21, per the long-range plan, we are making a $2 million withdrawal from the override stabilization fund. Below that, you can see the total, um, the total of those above amounts, in that we've also started adding for the past two years the money we take from the enterprise funds as offsets for the general fund service that is provided to those uh, enterprise funds, and we, sh we show those as a revenue per Department of Revenue's request. I'm going to stop here. Any questions about revenue? Okay. <clears throat> so this slide's even a little bit tougher to see, but this is uh, the expenditure forecast for FY21. You can see, if you, if you go to the third line, uh, the municipal department's taxation total. So that's the total expenditures of municipal departments less the offsets and indirect costs from the enterprise funds. And you can see this chart here uh, shows a 2.6% increase. We actually, the municipal departments are actually growing 3.21%, which is just below the 3.25% that's allowed under the long-range plan. The reason that's showing up as 2.6% is the board uh, will likely recall that $200,000 uh, was part of the override commitment to be put towards mobility improvements, mm -hmm. and that was put into the DPW's operating budget. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because those improvements are likely to be capital in nature, for FY21, we've moved that $200,000 into the capital plan. So it's created not an apples to orange comparison yeah. on this particular chart. Mm -hmm. for, just, just for the board's um, information on that. Does that mean the capital budget's gonna be over the 5%? Like, uh, in 2011, there was a $400,000 amount for roads. And the Capital Planning Committee made the policy recommendation that that 400000 be above and beyond or outside of the 5%. And they've also adopted that same stance for this $200,000. Thank you. Below that uh, is the school department, the combination of 3.5% general fund or uh, general education, excuse me, growth, 7% special education growth, 50% uh, per pupil expenditure funding for new students or enrollment growth, as well as the $600,000 uh, additive that was included as part of the override commitment adds up to that 6.4% increase. Minuteman School, you see a pretty significant increase there, 21.3%. Uh, <clears throat> We're going to a meeting on Friday at Minuteman. We have an expectation that number will come down some, though not, um, not entirely. Uh, the good news is their applications for enrollment for the next year uh, have them with a waiting list. So uh, predictions of their being, uh, you know, not filling the seats of this school uh, do not seem to be coming true. Uh, in, in fact, Arlington included many districts are wondering if all the kids are going to be able to get in based on the competition for the school. Uh, below that, we lump together in this chart uh, healthcare costs and pension costs. Uh, this year, health care is going up a little bit more than what we had expected. We budget a five and a quarter percent increase based on what we uh, think premium growth will be. However, we, we've been tracking for several years that a number of people, um, predominantly in the school department, would be hired, but because of the Affordable Care Act, uh, would not be taking the town's insurance because they were still in their parents' insurance. And what we're seeing is those people are aging in to the benefits, so we're seeing a larger subscribership in benefits. Uh, <clears throat> last year and this year than what prior, uh, previous, uh, previous years had budgeted. So we're seeing a little bit of a larger increase in health care. Mm -hmm. Pensions, uh, as part of this long-range plan and negotiation and discussion with the Retirement Board, uh, we've increased the pension uh, annual increase to 6% from the previous 5.5% that had been part of the prior long-range plan. Below that, you see the capital budget, uh, which is only going up by 1.6%, uh, but is in conformance with the 5% of general fund operating revenue. Uh, we then have warrant articles. Uh, that's, those are all the miscellaneous warrant articles, uh, some of which Sandy just highlighted in the quarterly report. The lion's share of that amount uh, is, <coughs> excuse me, the lion's share of that amount is our dedicated uh, funding to OPEB, the retiree mm -hmm. health care. So just about almost a million dollars of that amount goes towards OPEB. Mm -hmm. uh, under that, oh, I should mention under warrant articles, uh, one new warrant article we included this year, which I think uh, will merit a further board discussion as a standalone agenda item is funding for blue bikes. So the, I think the board knows Lime Bike has ceased operation. Uh, 
we also believe that Lime Bike has told us that there is demand for bike share in Arlington. So we are, uh, we've applied for grants to become part of the Blue Bike Network, but we've also asked for consideration of a warrant article in the amount of $100,000, uh, which is a far better deal than what it would have been several years ago. Uh, now that Lyft, the rideshare company, has bought Blue Bikes, they have a different funding model. Uh, so again, I, I don't want to belabor that. I think that's a separate agenda item, but that is part of this warrant article request. Below that is reserve fund and elections. Uh, that, uh, the reserve fund is 1% of the operating budget, and elections uh, are just what we uh, know will be held for elections. If there's special elections, we uh, you know, might have to go back to the reserve fund, but for what we know we'll have for elections next year uh, is included in that line. Uh, you can see last year there was a deposit to the override stabilization fund. Going back to revenues, we're, we're withdrawing, not depositing this year. And so you can see our total expenditure growth this year uh, of 4.2%. So any questions about expenditures before I go on? Oh, okay. <clears throat> so maintaining the board's override commitments. So uh, sort of top line, I would say this budget is maintaining all of the board's override commitments. Uh, the budget's definitely maintaining the board's commitment in terms of exercising fiscal discipline while maintaining quality municipal services. And what that really means is the commitments to controlling costs and growing school costs at uh, the agreed upon levels and town costs at or below the agreed upon levels has been maintained. So we feel that we're able to maintain quality municipal services at those levels while keeping our costs in control and sticking to the financial plan. Below that, uh, the budget also maintains the board's commitment to respond to the ongoing school enrollment pressures. Uh, we are funding the 50% of per pupil expenditures for their uh, for last year's actual enrollment growth, what was certified in October, well, I should say this year's for next year, what was certified on October 1st. The budget maintains the board's commitment to building Arlington's future. Uh, what that meant in the details of the board's commitment was uh, putting aside uh, or investing money in the school department in FYs 20, 21, 22, and 23 in the amounts of 600, 600, then 800, and 800 to try to meet uh, the five main points of what the school committee has committed to achieving in the school department. And it also maintains, as I mentioned a moment ago, the $200,000 commitment to mobility improvements and a $50,000 commitment to uh, senior transportation. And I think you heard Christine Shaw under the CDBG item talk a little bit about the enhancements they've already been able to see from those funds in FY20. Next, uh, the budget per se doesn't carry any of these measures, but I think it's important to mention that this board has already started to take action, town meeting has taken action, and the board is certainly considering further action to minimize the impact of last year's override and debt exclusion on taxpayers. I think the next big thing this board will be doing is considering a reduction in the debt shift when we come back, uh, likely next month or in early March, to make that request. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, this budget maintains the commitment to keep a 5% financial reserve for the duration of this four-year plan which is very important for the rating agencies in maintaining our AAA bond rating and thereby getting favorable borrowing rates when we go out to issue bonds. <clears throat> so next, what, uh, what are we making investments in in town departments? So first, we're making a significant investment in public works staffing. Uh, really over the part of the past uh, six to eight years, we've made investments across departments, but really no significant staffing investments in uh, DPW. Uh, we've added a, a tree warden and, 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 maybe, and maybe at the start of that six year, six to eight year window, added, uh, created a recycling coordinator, but not really a lot of additions to the public works department. Uh, but this year, working with the DPW director, we're recommending the addition of two positions. One is a permit engineer position. This would be somebody in the engineering division that would be solely focused on tracking all of the trench permits and the trenches uh, that are issued by the engineering division, whether they be by utilities or developers, and making sure those trenches are maintained or roadway repaving is done. Whatever, whatever's agreed upon as a condition of the permit, we want a dedicated resource uh, to be tracking that down. That ties in with the goals of our gas leaks task force, making sure we have uh, the best coordination possible with National Grid, the gas utility. Uh, it'll, also, it'll also allow the existing engineering staff to uh, move projects faster. So the time they currently spend on this, they'll be able to dedicate to water and sewer infrastructure, uh, roadway repavement, uh, ADA curb cuts, all the work that the engineering division does. Next uh, is, <clears throat> we're talking about adding a systems innovation manager. This position came out of a discussion with the public works director where I frankly said to him, if there's one thing, one position you could add that would most benefit DPW in getting its job done, what would it be? 
And what the Public Works Director said is, having somebody that could be dedicated in a role quite similar to Adam Kurowski, but focused on DPW, to work with the division heads in DPW, to upgrade and uh, update their workflow processes, to put in place an electronic fleet management system, to put in place a more updated work order system, to work individually in focus from start to finish and implement these projects. It's unfortunately been um, a task that's fallen in between the cracks as other larger projects have, uh, have taken priority. But uh, Mike Rademacher had suggested, and I agreed, that this could be a very impactful position in terms of our prov uh, providing public service uh, to the residents of town. Next, at the request of the police chief in coordination with the school superintendent, we're recommending the addition of an, uh, one police officer's position so that we can create a second school resource officer. Uh, I've learned through this process that the needs and duties of a school resource, uh, resource officer are growing more and more complex <coughs> with, growing, um, with the growing needs of the school population. Uh, what this would allow is for a dedicated uh, police officer, I believe, to be at the high school and then another officer to spend time between the middle school and the elementary schools. Uh, this is something the schools are interested in, and Acting Chief Flaherty uh, really felt strongly about being uh, an important step forward for the department. Next, um, mentioning an investment in community services. Uh, over the past, um, I think it's basically the past decade, we've gone from uh, having three days uh, open at the Fox Library to having five days open. Circulation has skyrocketed at the Fox Library, and through that time, we've had one full-time librarian at the Fox Library. Uh, through the work of the library director as well as the Board of Library Trustees, they asked that we create, um, it, it was taking basically a seven hour position and making it a 35 hour position, a second full time branch librarian uh, to report to the full time branch librarian at the Fox Library. So that investment's included in this budget. <clears throat> and then finally, there's a recommended investment in communication and transparency. So what we see actually in the town manager's department uh, in this budget is moving the public information officer from a part-time position to a full-time position and the addition of funding for part-time staff support uh, to manage and respond to the growing number of public records requests that the town is receiving. I'll say in terms of the public information officer, we, um, I think Arlington was on the vanguard in creating a public information officer's position some time ago uh, and thankfully it's caught on and many communities now are either have or are creating public information officers and they're all full-time positions. There's, there's plenty of work to do to communicate with the public. Uh, so I think the time is now to, to upgrade our position to a full-time position. Can any, I on that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm in agreement with moving it to full-time, but um, is there some way we can, when appropriate, if appropriate, sort of get an analysis? Because um, I've been following the public information requests as they come in. I mean, it def there definitely is a need for a full-time person there, but I'm, I'm also looking at, at, at the branches it sprouts from what the actual employee in town hall does, and then a council review, and then um, sometimes there's even a third party involved. Um, as, as this goes to full-time and it gets defined, um, I don't know how, but like, say Diane Mahan put a request in on Mugar. And from that request, maybe there were 20, a total of 20 requests. And that request, that MUGAR request by Mahan, um, what basically was done in-house in terms of whether it's number of hours devoted by the, the town employee, as well as what were the other um, ancillary unexpected costs when it had to go beyond that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we could <coughs> sort of somehow track that not to um, discourage anyone from um, taking steps and, and putting in requests but if everybody can sort of see a handle on it in terms of what it looks like right now um, and it may have some people look at it to say I'm kind of recreating the wheel and I'm going to double that expenditure again or, or something like that or, or just so people are aware I don't think a lot of people I think very few people I should say um, are really aware of following that through when it bounces to two or three other departments and two or three other costs, sometimes outside of the town hall. Do you understand what I'm trying to I do, say? Yeah. I, <clears throat> I don't want so, to limit people putting in requests. I just would like to get a hand, because I'm doing the math in my head and I'm like, please someone tell me I'm wrong sometimes. So let me, I know we track the amount of hours that staff uh, works in responding to public records requests. Um, let, me, let me see how we can put that data together to share it with the board. Yeah. 
I, I feel the same way as you. I don't begrudge anybody's opportunity under the law to access public records. Mm -hmm. What I don't think um, many people understand is that it takes a lot of time, especially when they're wide-ranging requests. Mm -hmm. We have to use IT consultants to search out uh, emails from any number of parties, and it can, it can get quite expensive to do these mm -hmm. searches, and, and very time-consuming. And sometimes when you go through those exercises, if you see something enough, you may find a more cost-effective <coughs> way um, to handle something like that. So, so tracking the expenses and the uh, extra costs, as well as sometimes going through that, it, um, it sometimes bears fruit on yeah. a positive trade. Yeah. Mr. DeCourse? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And just on, on that point, um, and I understand the need for, for additional resources for public records requests, but I, I'm hoping later this year we're going to have a new clerk elected in town, and in a number of communities, the clerk's office has a role in public record requests. So um, I hope there may be a way to, to work with the clerk's office uh, later in the year to see if there's a way to maybe relieve some of the burden from the town manager's office. So just allocate um, the way these requests are routed, yeah. at, if possible. Yep, yeah, I think it's a good suggestion as well. Thank you. Any other questions on this before we move on? All right, so the next slide. So moving on to the long-term outlook, in, in short, uh, this override maintains, um, again, the commitment to have this override last for four years through fiscal year 23. <clears throat> it maintains the investments in our long-term liabilities, both pension and OPEB. We're slightly increasing our investment in pension to stay on track and maintaining our investments in OPEB. Um, we're going to have to continue to monitor to, uh, enrollment trends. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, where we, we, we have our, our forecasts of growing enrollment and what impacts that will have in the plan, but significant deviation from that could have both a positive or negative impact uh, on the life of the plan. So that's something we'll keep tracking. And I think it's important to mention that we are going to continue state advocacy for new and varied revenue sources. Uh, we'll soon start to collect uh, Airbnb, uh, Airbnb fees. Uh, we've received our first payments from medical marijuana dispensary, and when the recreational dispensary opens up, we'll start to collect those fees. But um, I think we should continue focusing on what other sources of revenue the state might make available to us at the local level um, uh, to do the best we can to take the immediate uh, impact off the property taxpayer. So uh, going to the next slide. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. If you could hit the next one. So next steps. Next week on Wednesday, the Long Range Planning Committee uh, will be meeting on February 5th. Uh, that same day in the evening, the Finance Committee will kick off its process. Uh, so Sandy and I will be starting the day uh, at 8 a.m. with the Long Range Planning Committee and ending the day with the Finance Committee on the same day. <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, yeah. Uh, that same day, we'll be providing an updated Long Range Plan with, uh, uh, with the local aid numbers from the Governor's Budget, which I mentioned earlier are very favorable to Arlington this year. And the fact that this year is MMA meeting just this past weekend. A number of uh, my colleagues were giving me a hard time for how well Arlington did in the Chapter 70 formula as compared to them. Uh, I said, well, you know, like, what can I say? It's a good year for us. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Group Insurance Commission rates will be set by March 1st, so we'll get more granularity about the costs of um, health insurance then. And finally, throughout this whole process, we'll work with the Finance Committee to update figures, make any changes that are necessary before their final report is prepared for town meeting. I think with that, I think open to any other questions or discussion the board might have. Um, I think we, Mr. DeCourse. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just a, a couple things, and thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine, for the for the budget. And we're going to have a discussion later tonight about potential <coughs> Warren articles. But one of the things that it strikes me, and it it, it happens, it has happened over the years at, at FinCom is. You prepare a budget and you have to submit it to the select board by January 15th, yet the governor hasn't released his budget until later in the month. And I'm wondering when we get into the discussion later if we shouldn't consider moving the date that you have to submit the, the budget to the select board um, so that you can incorporate the governor's numbers. I'm just wondering if you think that would be helpful to give yourself that extra time. I, uh, Madam Chair, may I? Uh, I Absolutely think that would be helpful. Um, you know, internally, I know staff would be very supportive of having uh, even a February 1st submission date um, for the very purpose you stated. Uh, but, but more seriously, you know, we are in a situation where it, it's only one line of the budget. It's a significant line. But basically, the document we spend months working is rendered irrelevant 
you know, four days or you know, seven days after it's issued because of that setup. So um, I think there'd have to be discussion with the Finance Committee uh, to make sure that, that they don't feel like it was interrupting their process. But I do think given when the governor's budget comes out, thinking about even just two more weeks before this budget is due yeah. would be very prudent. Okay. And just one other thing quickly. In the end of the budget message, you refer to the structural deficit, which, which we have to encounter every year. And, and you mentioned in there that, that the process that we're going forward with the redevelopment board and, and hopefully with the entire community in terms of looking at, at potential zoning changes and increasing tax bases, the, the tax base. And, um, and I, I know it's always a challenge in, in terms of how things are going to, what changes may be made. But I, <clears throat> I think for those of you at home, the, the, the budget message is, is online and, and the manager really lays out what the challenge is because if we don't grow, um, we're, we're going to be faced with more and more overrides because of, uh, because of the structural deficit. So I appreciate you laying that out and really the reasons why we're having these discussions in terms of potential changes going forward. Um, Mr. Chapter just want to add, I, I should have led with this um, <coughs> book. Uh, this budget is the product of a, a lot of hard work by the department heads, but specifically uh, Sandy and Julie Wayman in my office really do an incredible job of putting this together. So I, I sit here giving the presentation, but uh, the thanks for this work definitely goes to Sandy and Julie, and I need to make that clear. <laughs> uh, first, is there a move or seat? So moved. Mr. Kiro, seconded Second. by Mr. Hurd. Um, any further questions or comments? Homage? Uh, if not, on a motion to move received by Mr. Carroll, seconded <coughs> by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous vote. Agenda item 15 for approval. Acceptance of bequest from the Daniel Strasberg Trust for the Robbins Library and authorization for release and receipt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. I just want to provide some background. This uh, very generous gift is to the Robbins Library from the Daniel Strasberg Trust. This is just a procedural matter. Tonight, there will be another occasion to celebrate this extremely generous gift that I think is appropriate for the Library Board of Trustees to be at the helm of. I also want to note that I received a question about whether or not this should be referred to the Memorial Committee first. Um, I think that you can proceed to accept the bequest and give me the authorization to sign the release and re uh, the receipt and release, uh, while also referring to the Public Memorials Committee to make sure that the plaque, which is really the only condition of this uh, very uh, substantial gift, um, will be sort of appropriately seen through to fruition. So with that, if the, unless the board has any questions, I'm looking just for a motion to uh, one, accept the bequest, and two, to authorize me to execute the re uh, receipt and release. And the, and the so, ge generous request is almost $630,000. Okay, uh, who's so moved. moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Second. uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, I agree with you, Attorney Heim, the steps that you've laid out and, and to go through that and then um, when appropriate uh, to make sure we do recognize um, as much as we can this very generous gift, uh, especially to the library. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I do want to note that uh, Ms. Nicolay, the uh, library director, and the Board of Trustees are, are very eager to, to plan an appropriate uh, memorialization and celebration of this uh, gentleman who gave such an uh, amazing gift to the library of six hundred, yeah. almost $50,000. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. Um, a motion to approve by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Any further questions or comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And we'll... <coughs> sure see this in the future with, with our thanks and gratitude. And I think um, to the second part of, Madam Chair, to mm -hmm. the second part of Mr. Himes' comment, uh, may I move that we request uh, the Public Memorial uh, Committee um, assent to the, uh, to the placement of the, the plaque. Um, second. Okay. Um, a motion to refer this to the Public Memorials Committee vis-a-vis -vis the plaque made by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Any further questions or comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Well, thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, agenda item 16, potential 2020 town meeting warrant articles from the select board. Attorney Heim. So there are two, thank you, Madam Chair. There are two buckets of warrant articles uh, before the board. 
One is uh, the recommendations and requests from the Election Modernization Study Committee, which has representatives in attendance tonight. And the other are a set of sort of miscellaneous worn articles that come from a variety of committees or town department heads um, in which the select board may or may not want to sort of endorse these articles as being on the warrant. Just for the public's edification, uh, voting to place the matter on the warrant is basically <coughs> voting to have the discussion at a warrant article hearing and potentially town meeting. It's not necessarily the same thing as the board saying they agree with the underlying matter. Um, so uh, if with the chair's uh, permission, I know that there are some folks here from uh, the Election Modernization Committee who might like to speak on the three articles that they'd like to have submitted. But I'm also happy to talk about them if, if they like. Good evening. James O'Connor, chair of the Election Modernization Committee. Greg Dennis, clerk of the Election Modernization Committee. So we come before you. I believe you have reference points on uh, some memoranda you received. Uh, we have three articles, one of which was asked, I believe um, Mr. DeCourcy might have asked this at our November presentation as to whether we would have sufficient time to conclude our work this year. We definitely find that there is a lot more work to be done. So we wanted to submit a warrant article that uh, with the <coughs> support and recommendations of both the moderator and the town council, we'd like to uh, consider a warrant article to extend the life of the election modernization committee, change its structure, objectives, or membership, and take any action related thereto. Uh, one of the issues that came up in the composition is that a few of the designated parties have not been able or willing to attend, so maybe they don't need to be on the committee, um, and we could appoint someone or look at someone who really wants to be on the committee. Um, secondly, it's better than um, the pipes banging. So go ahead. That was not, <laughs> that was not planned, but that's interesting. The second thing was that there was a question that Mr. Dunn addressed before is why are some of the members not in attendance that were designated? And that's because they don't have voting power. So with the composition, we thought about as a committee whether or not we would want to extend voting authorization to all members and to um, also extend the life of the committee at least for another year. Um, if not further. So um, at the recommendation of Mr. Heim, we would like to ask, although we've been told that we can submit the warrant article independently uh, as a committee without 10 registered voter signatures, that we'd like the blessing of the select board. So it was his um, astute suggestion that we submit it at the recommendation um, of the and the Election Modernization Committee by the Select Board. Attorney Heim, can I just ask procedurally what we do tonight is we can receive this, but we need to schedule it for a hearing? Uh, so what I would be, I think what the committee is, is asking for is the board to vote to place these three articles in the warrant uh, in, as inserted by the Select Board at the requested Election Modernization Study Committee. Uh, by way of background, just for folks who don't re remember or know in the public, um, this board was one of the entities that helped create the Election Modernization Study Committee, so it seemed appropriate that this body would come back and um, seek the board's basically vote to place these articles on the warrant uh, by the select board at the request of the Modernization Committee. I'd say let's hear them all and do them all in the motion. Okay. Did you have a question? Mr. Chapdelaine? No. So I'm sorry. From a precedent point of view, I don't know that I've ever seen inserted <clears throat> by the Board of Selectmen at the request of. Yeah. We normally do inserted at the request of with the assumption is that it's always by the Board of Selectmen. Okay. That, if, that, if the Board would be more comfortable with that, that's fine. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. We had seen that it was uh, the electronic voting that um, there was an, an article in the past that had that 
edition. Any questions about that? The other two articles which we are considering is the election. Oh, should we? Yeah. Uh, the, the other two articles, one would consolidate um, the town meeting member elections into a single election per precinct, even when there are uh, midterm vacancies, and the other uh, would use ranked choice voting to elect uh, town offices. Mr. Dunn. I move that we put all of these on the warrant. Second. Seconded by Mr. Caro. Um, any questions, comments on these three? If not, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Caro to place these on the warrant um, with the language previously discussed. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> Unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Hine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm happy to proceed in either fashion. We could proceed one by one, or I could go through all of them at once. Do you have a preference, Madam Chair? Whatever you think is mo more expeditious. Okay. You want to just go through them all? I'll go through all the articles. Is that the best way to go? And then maybe just keep going until a question comes up? Want to Sounds do it that way? Okay. Thank you. So the first article before the board uh, is following up on Mr. Curo, uh, a discussion that was led by Mr. Curo at a previous meeting. Um, I'd done a little bit more research on the idea of a senior water discount and essentially found that while the board has the power to uh, adopt a water discount for senior residents, in order for certain elements of it to be integrated with, um, for example, the um, means-tested tax deferral and work-off programs, we would have to use home rule legislation according to the Department of Revenue. So if the board is contemplating a senior water disc discount program that might be more expansive, I wanted to see if the board wanted a placeholder on the warrant for that purpose. If the board would like to start sort of with baby steps and just start with the senior water discount program that's within, that's a little less ambitious, um, that's, that's fine too and we could reserve this article for a later discussion. Okay. Then the next article is, uh, in, is basically requested uh, for your consideration by the engineering division and uh, the environmental planner, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, it's essentially a request to modernize the stormwater bylaw, uh, stormwater management bylaw. There are some pieces of it that they're finding are a little bit inefficient in its operation, and uh, they'd like to clarify some things so that folks have a better understanding of what's applicable and what's not. The third is a request for home rule legislation that would allow retired Arlington police officers to work police details. Um, this has been something that the officers have been negotiating through collective bargaining with the town, and this is essentially our way of fulfilling that promise. Um, there are a whole bunch of conditions in here that uh, appropriately mean that we can hedge some risk. I don't want to make it clear that, that well, this is not the warrant article hearing itself. In terms of putting this in the warrant, not every risk can be hedged. When you have retired workers coming back on the force, you assume, you assume uh, a little bit of risk. Um, but uh, most of that is covered in what's a very expansive Warren article to keep the scope of this uh, very narrow, very specific. Um, the next article is, speaks to what um, representatives from a Sustainable Arlington Mothers at front, up front had spoke about previously, as well as the Clean Energy uh, Future Committee. Clean Energy uh, Future Committee. Um, I've crafted this in a way to try to be flexible in the manner that folks have talked about. So it's not to take all the specific details from the Brookline Warren article and just sort of jam it right into Arlington. There's a number of pieces that would not necessarily fit. And Brookline did have <coughs> a lengthy process um, before they adopted uh, or before they put this uh, bylaw in front of their town meeting. But I think that this captures it. The one sort of adjustment that I, I might make to it with the board's permission is to actually expand on the language and to provide for exemptions to same, to say, and to provide uh, for exemptions, waivers, or exceptions to same after having heard a few people talk about it here. Um, the next article, uh, the DPW director is still interested <coughs> in um, water and sewer line replacement. Um, as the board would recall, this was on last year's warrant. Um, we attempted to come up with some uh, models that didn't entirely uh, satisfy the board and I think in the board's wisdom decided we weren't ready to go on that. Um, if we want to return to that discussion, uh, this article would uh, be appropriate. Next, the town bylaw amendment to uh, create a municipal affordable housing trust fund. Uh, with 
if the board is inclined to put this on, uh, the housing implementation, um, housing plan implementation committee is still tinkering a little bit with exactly what they'd like. And I'd like the board to potentially vote on this article to give a little bit flexibility so that this article in concept, but in detail, might have a few things worked out by the end of the week. Um, and the long and short of that is that it creates an affordable housing trust. We talked a little bit about this at the uh, joint meeting, so I don't want to belabor it unless anybody has any questions. But it essentially helps us have a flexible tool to promote affordable housing in Arlington, whether it's creation, acquisition, sale, um, certain types of improvements. Uh, and then, I think that's it. That's it. Okay. And, um, and we do have, if anything else should arise in the near future, this board does have up until the time that the warrant has to be sent out to the printer <coughs> um, if we need to add or, or do anything else. Um, we still have that window of opportunity. But um, Ma it, Madam Chair, it, it can, just to add to what Town Council mm -hmm. shared, I, I guess I would suggest for the board's consideration if the board wanted to, the first one in regards to the water discount may be appropriate for inserted by the Board of Selectmen. Um, storm order management and the police officer, uh, retired police officer details, um, I think would fit well under inserted at the request of the town manager. Uh, the fossil fuel infrastructure, I think the Clean Energy Future Committee um, wants the board's support but would like it to be inserted at the request of the Clean Energy Future Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, the sewer line replacement, similarly by the town manager and the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund, as uh, the Town Council mentioned, by the Housing Plan Implementation Committee. Uh, again, subject to the board's discretion. But. So I move to include these articles on the warrant um, with, with those. Um, Submission, submission uh, yeah. Submission descriptions. Submission description. Submission descriptions as Don't well. Don't make so me say that with this revisions. too, please. Yeah. The revisions, please. The revisions presented <coughs> by the town council. Okay. Motion by Mr. Curo, seconded by Second. Mr. Hurd. Um, any further, Mr. Dunn? Just under the first one. Um, we don't, it doesn't feel like we have anything that we're going to be trying, the water discount. It doesn't feel like we're going to be having anything to do there. At the same time, it is worth doing it maybe for just even for advertising purposes. Yeah. But I, I feel, I mean, just, in, I'm fine with putting on the warrant. I have absolutely no yeah. problem with it. I just, what is our battle plan? Well, uh, I'll say I didn't, I didn't realize, and I, I thank Mr. Heim for putting, putting this here. I actually didn't realize until I was going through the packet that this was included here. Um, but that, that having been said, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the substance, but as I read the comment, it sounds like even if we were to follow the model of some communities where we're making it um, uh, means tested, where it's tied to their qualification mm -hmm. for some of the tax programs, we, we, it looks like we might have to do this. Okay, got it. All right. Keep it on. Sounds for the good. Rule petition. Yeah. For the low friction yeah. program. Yeah. Sounds good. On a motion, any further questions or comments on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you. I, I had a question on, for, mm -hmm. for this agenda. So, Mr. DeCourse, you raised this question about the deadlines on budget submission. Did you want a placeholder so that we could have that discussion? Well, I'd, I'd like to have a placeholder, but from what the, the chair said, we, we still have time to, to add that. And I, I haven't, I think what we'd, we'd be looking to do is, is uh, amend section 31 of the town manager act but right. um, if there's <coughs> time to do that I can report back at the next meeting or make that request so there's something before the board and consult with attorney Hyde. We, uh, Madam Chair Mayor, we also have the ability to insert articles in the special town meeting warrant which is um, which would afford yeah. uh, even which more time and which, which gives us a lot more time. So I'll leave that to you, Mr. DeCourcy, to... Yeah, that's fine. And, and I, I guess maybe just a question. When you say there is additional time, what, how much additional time do we have? It's, I mean, Friday is the deadline for warrant article submission. But they're going but, but to, they're going to the, the printer. Board can do, though. The select board, we can submit it up until before it goes to the printer, as long as there is a meeting. Right. The printer, we don't go to, like, the middle of the month? So, I mean, it's a... Yeah. We typically only really make... Um, like adjust wording mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We, like, I mean, we don't drop things in whole uh, after the deadline usually. So I would, I would say, if we want to put it in, like, let, let's put it in now, and then let the language be worked out by town council. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then, then, with that, I'd like to, to, to make a, 
a motion to include uh, that uh, amendment as, as a placeholder. Second. On a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Any further questions or comments who include that um, additional language? As a warrant article, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, <coughs> we do have an executive session, but um, Ms. Maher, any new business? New business. Attorney Hyde? I'm sorry, I do have one piece of important new business. Um, my colleague in the legal department uh, does not uh, care for fanfare, but uh, Mr. Marlenga, Attorney Marlenga, is retiring after 41 years of service on Friday. And so if any members of the board have a moment, uh, his uh, service for the town has uh, always been uh, a matter that's been fairly uh, quiet, uh, but exemplary. And uh, if any folks have time to put in a call to Mr. Marlenga, I'm sure uh, he would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, well said. Uh, two very quick pieces. Uh, I know some of the board members may share this as well. I just want to thank the board for the racial equity training that they attended last Wednesday, uh, and also mention that we had a very successful training with 65 town staff across departments the following day on Thursday, uh, where it was a whole day training with Leon and Rita uh, that was really impactful, and I think we um, really opened a lot of eyes and started a great dialogue uh, across town departments. Uh, and then very quickly, I'll share that this past uh, Friday and Saturday was the MMA annual meeting. Uh, very, um, very interesting, successful meeting, lots of good topics. Uh, Leon Andrews was actually the <coughs> closing keynote speaker and uh, asked me to join him at the end of his presentation to share a little bit about the work that Arlington is doing, so that was a nice opportunity, fresh off last week's training, to share that. Uh, but I also wanted to share that um, I was very honored uh, being uh, elected or selected by my uh, peers across municipal government for this year to serve as the Mass Municipal Association's vice president. Uh, at this annual meeting, which would put me in line to become the president of the association next year. So it was a, a nice uh, honor to, to be selected for that this weekend. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Mr. DeCourcy. I have no new business. Mr. Dunn. Nothing. Mr. Hurd. Just a segue from the town manager. Just again, want to thank Leon Andrews and his team for just a great presentation and gave us some food for thought to identify some areas that we can work on in the, as in, in the town. Then I popped into the MMA conference this weekend. Didn't have the time to spend as much time as I'd like to, but every year, when you look at the speaker lineup, <coughs> there's always a couple of members of our staff, including the town manager. It just shows what, how much respect and talent our staff is amongst the, uh, the other uh, managers and employees in the state. Mr. Carroll. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to note that um, when I went to the MMA, I, I managed to go to two sessions that were packed to the gills. One was on uh, strategies to uh, protect the towns, uh, municipalities, and our employees uh, in the face mm -hmm. of um, abusive and threatening social media and uh, steps that, that um, municipalities can take. And the other one was on um, very apropos of some things that we've seen here, uh, civility in public meetings and um, strategies for municipalities to take uh, uh, around codes of conduct, uh, both behavior within boards, between, between, between boards and the public and, and expectations of um, the public in such meetings. And both of those sessions were absolutely standing room only. So um, I think it's, it's saying something about kind of the the tenor in the air these days. Hey, Thank you. Um, with that, I have no new business. I will take, entertain a motion from my colleague. Can we do it one motion or two separate ones? Uh, we can, uh, Madam Chair, we can do one motion, but we need to uh, be clear that we're going to executive session for two purposes. And one has to very explicitly say, state that the um, that negotiation or uh, the board's position would be impacted by a public discussion of any real estate um, valuation or transaction. So a <coughs> motion to enter executive session uh, for both purposes listed on our notice, including um, consideration of purchase, exchange, lease, or, uh, or value of real property, uh, a public discussion of which would materially uh, affect the board's uh, negotiation position. As well as? as well as um, complying with the 
open meeting law, approval of the executive session minutes of January 2nd, 2020. Motion by. So moved. Mr. Dunn, Second. seconded by. Mr. Hurd, roll call. Ms. Marr? Yes. She didn't say. Yes. 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 Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. DeCorsi? Yes. And I'm sorry, Ms. Mahan, I made a mistake. Uh, my understanding is the board will not be convening back in open session, correct? So um, added to that, that at the end of the motion, that when the board um, comes out of uh, executive session into open session, it will be per. No, we'll, we'll adjourn. be adjourning in executive session. I apologize, yes. Madam okay. Chair. So the, that is indeed my motion. Okay, sorry. Yeah. No. All right. Um, ACMI, we're all set, and when we come back, we're just going to be done. So. Okay.